All right, so any questions from yesterday? Feel pretty comfortable with epilepsy? Um, we'll cover, we'll finish up with that and then we'll go on into some of the other neuro subjects for today and we'll finish out the section um, over these next four hours. So lucky us together all day. Um, all right, so anyway, so when do you stop anti-epileptic drugs? Um, for some people, they may never. They may be on it, you know, uh, forever. But to consider that, you may uh, find that if they, some of the guidelines recommended they're seizure-free for, say, two to five years or so while they're on anti-epileptic drugs. That might be one consideration. Usually, they have one single seizure type, and they don't have any kind of abnormal neurological exam, meaning there's no uh, abnormal lesions, and they have a relatively normal exam you know, while they're on these drugs, and have a normal EEG. The goal here with these drugs is especially to, when you decide to taper off, like you have to taper. You can't just abruptly take them off, especially of some of the more, um, uh, you know, the benzodiazepines and, and barbiturates because there is an adaptation. If you take that away too quickly, there's a chance for rebound seizures. So you want to make sure you do it real slow with these, um, especially benzos and barbs. So um, when looking at drug levels, so I mentioned a few that we would get levels on uh, with some regularities, like phenytoin's one, carbamazepine, valproic acid. Those are probably the most common ones that we get levels for. Phenobarb would be the other um, big one. The question is like, well, you know, why are we checking levels? We kind of talked about this previously. So one, you could check for efficacy, right? So if the patient's still having breakthrough seizures, that could be one reason why you want to check a level to make sure they're actually within the therapeutic range. Um, the other thing would be with safety uh, purposes, so they're having adverse drug reactions and you suspect that they might be too high of a level, that would be another indication to go ahead and get it there. Um, the big thing though is you always want to make sure you get to steady state first, right? Because uh, if you check too early, levels are going to be falsely low. So you need to make sure you have given that drug time or if they got a bolus beforehand, that should have gotten them up to steady state pretty pretty quickly. So that would be okay to time to check as well. Um, also, if you're looking for any drug interactions, we talked about a lot of SIP inducers, a lot of SIP inhibitors, like Lamotrigine is particularly susceptible to several different types of reactions. So you might want to check up for that. Um, and then also if you have other disease states that may be interacting here. The thing, though, is you want to make sure you're treating the patient, not just the number. Okay, so if a patient has a sub-therapeutic value, based on the reference range, uh, but they're having no seizures, no adverse effects, leave it alone, right? If they're a little high, no problems, no seizures, leave it alone, okay? Um, the thing I will run into in some cases, you may want to check for compliance to see if the patient's actually taking the drug. That might be one reason to check a level for a drug that doesn't really have a good therapeutic um, corollary. So for instance, like um, uh, Keppra, so you might want to check a Keppra level, even though we don't know what levels really equate to therapeutic effect, just to see if the patient's taking it. That could be one reason why they're having seizures. Um, but, you know, a lot of these are, they're not done routinely, are send outs. You have to send them out to an outside lab, and they're pretty expensive, and they take time to come back. So they're not always useful. And I'll have docs who will be like, well, I want to get a, a lamictal level. And I'm like, well, what's a therapeutic lamictal level? And they're like, well, we don't know. So why do you want to check a level? A lot of times you don't necessarily need to check a level unless you're just looking to make sure they're actually taking it. So be pretty judicious when you're doing that. Um, so going back to adverse reactions, again, sedation is going to be the biggest thing with a lot of these because, again, we are making these neurons more difficult to have an actual potential, more difficult to fire off. So uh, this is going to be the biggest thing. So your fall risk is going to be a big deal. Uh, difficulty concentrating, memory impairment. So always be aware of that. Make sure you're educating them about this. Um, typically what you see is that Lamotrigine and Valproic acid tend to be a little less drowsy uh, causing than, than some of the other drugs. So that might be one thing you want to shoot for, especially if they have a you know job that they commute every day for. Actually, if they're having a seizure disorder, it might be not necessarily uh, driving necessarily, but you know if you need, uh, if they're in school or something like that, less um, drowsiness inducing drugs are going to be a little bit better from that. Uh, phenobarb, again, not going to be super used a lot, especially in young kids due to that kind of memory impairment, concentration impairment kind of problem there. And then see, a few of them did have some issues with like a psychiatric um, uh, disturbances, especially uh, Keppra. That's kind of the unique one uh, that has, does have a warning on that about causing that increased aggression in kids. Um, and then like really some of the other ones, you know, depression and anxiety are all at risk for these. So again, just be aware, make sure you're checking for changes over time, see what the kind of baseline is and see how they change with the drugs on board. As far as that dermatologic reactions, again, we saw things like uh, carbamazepine, phenytoin, phenobarb tend to be more common, causing uh, rashes and things like that. So make sure they're aware to look for those. Um, but keep in mind, especially oxcarbazepine and lamotrigine, they're developing new rash, blisters, anything like that. It could be early signs of them developing into Stevens Johnson. They need to take, uh, come in, get evaluated, probably get off the meds uh, altogether. And again, it's not something you want to rechallenge with that because they could have it again if you were to readminister the drug. So that would be contraindication from them receiving that again.
far as hematologic stuff goes, um, again, things like, you know, carbamazepine, valproic acid, those are good ones to go ahead and check CVCs, again, a baseline and a follow-up. Look for things like thrombocytopenia, um, you know, any kind of um, uh, leukopenia, anything like that, you can check for those. Um, other things you can have the patient kind of monitor for at home, they don't necessarily have to get CBCs for, but things like un, um, you know, unprovoked kind of bru bru bruising and bleeding, any kind of sore mouth, throat, things like that could be indicative of, of an issue there. Again, I mentioned that felbamate is kind of unique in it causing aplastic anemia. So again, that's one we really hold off for unless they're refractory to most other stuff. Uh, a lot of these, as we mentioned, are going to be hepatically metabolized. So you do need to watch out if they have hepatitis or hepatic failure. This could be exacerbated by some of these drugs like carbamazepine, fenitoin, valproic acid. Um, keep in mind, sometimes, uh, again, some of it may be due to drug interactions or levels are jumping up. That could predispose them to hepatic injury as well. So watch out for those. Um, Right. So as far as monitoring goes, in general, seizure control, see if they're having seizures, you know, uh, how often, how, you know, if there's any particular uh, things that are precipitating them. Look for these adverse drug reactions and then levels only if indicated, only if they have a good therapeutic range associated with them. So again, very few of those that I mentioned here. And then any labs is necessary. Do um, you remember which ones I said you need to check your sodium for? Think carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine. Those are two of the big ones that can cause hyponatremia, right? Um, already talked about the uh, therapy drug monitoring. Again, you need to make sure if you're going to be checking the level, they have a good corollary to what levels are toxic, what levels are therapeutic. Otherwise, it's not going to be super useful. And again, always watch for your drug interactions. Again, I mentioned like, you know, uh, carbamazepine, you know, valproic acid, phenytoin. Those are the big ones causing a SIP drug interaction. So always, always, always double check prior to prescribing. Just run it through an interaction checker, have your pharmacist call them, have them do it for you, whatever you need to do, because you want to make sure you don't screw this up and get uh, their levels into all kinds of wacky ranges, either from the anti-epileptic drug standpoint or the other drugs that they're interacting with. Oral contraceptives are kind of interesting. Um, I mentioned you know, some of these drugs are, are triadogenic, especially valproic acid, and you know we want to make sure that the patients, uh, if they're taking oral contraceptives for reasons of prophylaxis or preventing pregnancy, um, they don't have any issues uh, making sure that the, those drugs are actually working. And so you can find that things that are inducing some of the SIP enzymes tend to increase the metabolism of estradiol and can actually make those oral contraceptives less effective. So things like phenobarb, carbamazepine, those are uh, some of the bigger ones. Um, there are those that do not really interact with the oral contraceptive, so those might be a better one to shoot for if their patients are, are taking those. Um, because again, you know, there's no good estimate to say, well, should I just double up on the oral contraceptive dose? Like, there's no good way to, to really counteract that. So you may want to shoot for these other ones, like, you know, again, primarily the ones that are um, eliminated through renal means or the ones that don't really have any SIP interactions, like Lamotrigine or Keppra, things like that. Um, now, as to say, these are really only with oral contraceptives that we're dealing with. If you were to have something like a depo shot like of medroxyprogesterone, uh, depo provera, that would not interact, right? And again, this is more of an estrogen issue rather than a progestin issue. We'll talk more about this in the next section when we get to ob -GYN. Um, but also intrauterine devices, um, either hormone or not, are also not going to be affected by this. So if they had like a copper implant, uh, if they had, uh, you know, a nuva ring or anything like that, those would not be affected. It's really only the oral contraceptives that are going through the liver when they're being absorbed initially. That makes sense? Okay. Because again, a lot of these are going to be affecting the baby. When's uh, organogenesis occur for the fetus? First trimester, right? And so those are the times where a lot of women may not know they're pregnant and they're being exposed to these drugs that could be deleterious for, for the baby. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. Okay, so any questions on seizures or epilepsy? All right, moving on, we'll talk about Parkinson's disease next. Have you guys talked about this yet? All right, good. So there should be experts on, on the treatment thereof. What's our gold, gold standard drug for Parkinson's? Carbidopa, levodopa, right? Absolutely. It's going to be a good one. We'll talk about that uh, in just a little bit. So what, what is Parkinson's? Thank you for reading the slide for me. I appreciate that. <laughs> Anyone else? How would you describe it to, to a patient? Loss of dopamine. Good progressive loss of, of dopaminergic neurons. That's good. It's a movement disorder. Absolutely. Is it an issue initiating movement or stopping movement? Yeah, initiating movement is the big thing here. So I'll show you kind of the, the neuronal circuitry, which I'm sure you've seen the slides of previously just a little bit. But again, the four kind of cardinal signs here are going to be this kind of resting tremor, 
right? We'll see that's more of an acetylcholine problem just a little bit. There's that rigidity and the, and the hypokinesia, because again, it's very difficult for them to initiate movements due to the loss of dopaminergic neurons and that posture instability that comes along with that. Has anyone seen that movie Awakenings with Robin Williams and Robert De Niro? Very good movie. I think it's actually uh, a very good portrayal. It's kind of talking about the initial treatments they had for, for Parkinson's. Um, but if you get a chance to watch that movie, it's very neat to see kind of that progression of uh, going from pure catatonic state. They basically have no dopamine to initiating the drug. And they just have this kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, their symptoms get much, much improved. And then eventually, as we'll see with all Parkinson's patients, eventually the drugs kind of wear off and they're not going to work anymore for them. So for a little bit of a sad movie, but uh, very interesting. Anywho, um, lots of different purposes uh, or reasons why people develop Parkinson's. There's some genetic components to it, certainly age-related degeneration is probably one of the big ones. Um, does anyone know what is a protective thing against Parkinson's? It is kind of counterintuitive. Actually, smoking is one of the few things that actually has a protective effect on Parkinson's and some of the studies they've done. Uh, it gives you everything else, heart disease and lung disease and all kinds of problems, but you, probably, you may not get Parkinson's, who knows? I don't know. <laughs> I'm counting on you to make one up. No, um, honestly, that would be too far out of my rear end. Uh, I wouldn't see the light of day for a while to come up with an excuse for that one. But anyway, um, there's some drug-induced causes for uh, Parkinson-like symptoms as well. And so, have you covered this? Any antipsychotics in uh, CVM, right? So you'll, you'll know that those are dopamine-blocking drugs. And so again, this causes a functional sort of Parkinsonism, and, and you see that in a lot of the side effects associated with them. We'll talk about those more in the behavioral section, so I won't kind of elucidate that too much. Um, but certainly, uh, there's some chemicals here that are really, um, uh, that could be cause, you know, potential Parkinson's due to uh, degradation of the dopaminergic neurons, like methanol. Anyone know what you find methanol in? Hmm? Yeah, uh, windshield washer fluid is one thing. You don't see that a lot in Florida, but there, you can see that there. Um, and then carbon monoxide is another big one. Uh, anyone ever heard of MPTP? This is kind of an interesting story. Um, there's a, I think there's a book out about it called about like, the junkie who froze or something like that. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, but basically, back in the day when people were trying to design their own uh, kind of designer uh, drugs of abuse. I believe they're trying to make uh, designer like Demerol or something or some sort of opioid. Um, you had these street chemists. And I don't know, who, who took organic chemistry here? Who was like a whiz kid there and and you know all their labs worked perfect <laughs> right so imagine if you were trying to make your own drugs to get high would you feel pretty comfortable in taking them yeah. i wouldn't at least right and i'm a pharmacist so um but this this one particular person they they designed this drug and actually this mptp and it converts to this, meta uh, this metabolite it actually like just goes and destroys all these dopaminergic neurons so when they found this guy after he had, had, had done this drug um, they found him in his basic catatonic state it was like he'd given himself parkinson's um very sad for him but what was actually interesting is that now we had a chemical that could help us induce a parkinson-like state in like in, in uh, laboratory animals like mice and things like that so it actually gives us a really good model for how to test a lot of these uh, drugs that we now use for for parkinson's so you can Google that story. Uh, it's very kind of interesting if you get a chance to, to read up about it. But, um, you know, chemicals can be a, a causative effect here. Off of that tangent. Um, so, again, looking at the pathophysiology, so the substantia nigra is really important for these dopaminergic uh, projections um, into into the striatum here. And so you're going to have the primary, um, two primary ones. You're going to have these D1, they're going to be stimulatory receptors, and then uh, these inhibitory D2. So you can see here on this slide that here's kind of the normal functioning that goes on. Have you seen a slide similar to this before? No, you've probably seen it. Okay, so you've seen something similar. So basically, ultimately what you're seeing here is there's uh, multiple different steps that go along here. And so keep in mind when you're looking at these, it makes a lot more sense if you consider you know, D1 to be stimulatory. If I stimulate a GABA neuron, I'm going to stimulate that neuron to release more GABA, right, which is ultimately going to be inhibitory. Kind of doesn't make sense if you're stimulating something that's ultimately inhibitory. Kind of seems odd. But anyway, this is the way that it normally functions, right? The problem when you come in when you have uh, Parkinson's, and just not to, bel to belabor the point, eventually you're getting way too much GABA activity on the thalamus here. And so this is going to uh, have a very strong inhibitory effect on the thalamus, which will lead you to have less of a, uh, a stimulatory effect here on the motor cortex. That's basically what's happening here. This is why that you have this hypokinesia, this difficulty initiating movement, because you have way too much uh, suppression here on the thalamus and due to the GABAergic neurons, right? Because basically upstream, you've got depletion of these, uh, the dopamine is being released from here. Okay. So ideally, how are we going to fix this problem? Get more dopamine, right? So could I just give them dopamine in an IV? We have that available, right? Why doesn't that work? There you go. It doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So that's a very important point there um, that we cannot give just dopamine by itself, even though dopamine, you know, it's a, it's a normal product your body produces anyway, but it does not cross the blood brain barrier on its own.
we got to come up with some ways to come about, uh, get around that. The other thing to note here is that when you have a depletion of dopamine, you kind of have the seesaw effect with acetylcholine, where basically you're going to have too much acetylcholine activity. And we know that acetylcholine is very important on those mus uh, the nicotinic receptors on the skeletal muscle, and that's what leads to a lot of that resting tremor that happens there. Um, so less dopamine, more acetylcholine, then you get the tremor. That'll be important for one uh, set of drugs that we're going to use in order to treat that particular symptom itself. DA is dopamine. Sorry, I, heard, I thought I heard some of that. Anyway, so uh, imagine here you have your dopaminergic neuron. Uh, I made it orange just for random reason. I have no idea. Um, but basically, you end up seeing things like phenylalanine or tyrosine comes into the neuron here. And you notice this conversion to eventually getting to the actual active component, this dopamine here. Two main enzymes that are very important here are going to be this COMT, this catecholamine O-methyltransferase that will metabolize L-DOPA. And you're also going to have uh, monamine oxidase B. There's also other varieties of monoamine oxidase. Have you guys covered the monoamine oxidase inhibitors in CBM? Right, we don't use them anymore. They're kind of bad drugs uh, for the most part, but these are unselective inhibitors of monoamine oxidase A and B. Here, you're gonna find we have selective ones for just the B isoenzyme. So again, think monoamine oxidase B, think Parkinson's as far as uh, drugs go. So anyway, so we have these two enzymes. These are the important ones um, because if we inhibit these, what happens to our dopamine levels? It should go up, right? Because if I'm inhibiting the metabolism of dopamine, there should be more available, more for those neurons to, to uh, secrete out in, into the synapse, right? So keep that in mind when we talk about the drugs we're going to use for these patients. All right. So again, presentation, I'm not going to get super in-depth on this because you've covered it already. But again, those four cardinal signs are really the big ones you're going to see. Um, but there's lots of other motor symptoms that happen here as well. You see that, uh, you know, especially the dysphagia can be really problematic because a lot of the meds that we give are oral. Uh, so if they're not able to swallow, Tablets, that can be problematic. And so dosage forms are really important uh, for some of this. Um, we're also going to have a lot of autonomic symptoms that come about from this, things like uh, incontinence, constipation, a lot of orthostasis. And this is important because a lot of the drugs we're going to give, uh, main side effects is going to be orthostatic hypotension, right? And they already have postural instability and they already have kind of difficulty initiating movement. So what are they a big risk for? <coughs> Falls. Falls are going to be a big thing. Because again, if you get a hip fracture, that has all kinds of negative effects on you know, morbidity, mortality, and all of that. So we don't want that. Um, all right, there's also a lot of psychosis and dementia that goes along with this. Uh, another problem you run into some of these drugs is that they can cause things like hallucinations and depression and whatnot. So it's sometimes hard to tell or is that they're just getting worse from a mental standpoint, uh, mental status standpoint, just due to the drug or due to the disease process. And this is where good monitoring comes from, having uh, you know, either family members or healthcare providers able to kind of monitor for those things. So anywho, um, how do you diagnose Parkinson's? Is there a test we can do? Yeah. Isn't it just a clinical? Usually, yeah, usually it's a clinical diagnosis, right? So they have all those kind of cardinal signs. It's a really good thing uh, to do. Um, the other thing you could do is potentially give a drug called apomorphine, or you can give levodopa itself. And so either giving one of these drugs actually can give you an idea if you give this to them and they all of a sudden get better. Have you guys covered apomorphine at all? Uh, so it's also a dopamine agonist. Basically, it works um, instead of being converted into dopamine like levodopa is. It just works on the dopamine receptors. These are two provocative sort of tests we can give. The patient's symptoms improve, and it gives you a pretty good sign they have Parkinson's, right? Because they, they were lacking dopamine. You've given them some kind of dopamine agonist. Now, now they're getting better. So that's one way we can actually diagnose this, uh, if not just going off of clinical symptoms. Okay, so our goals here, we'd like to help to minimize or reverse any kind of functional uh, instability they have or disability. And then we want to try to minimize or, and prevent those uh, kind of long-term complications. Is there any reversal of this disease state? Not at this time, right? We can try to slow things down a little bit, but primarily um, we're trying to deal with the symptoms primarily. So we can't really fix the baseline issue with drugs, unfortunately. So obviously there's a lot of non-pharmacologic uh, help you can give these patients education and support is going to be a huge um, uh, part of this, along with a lot of exercise and speech therapy uh, to help them try to maintain as much ability as they can. Um, and there's some surgical options here as well, which I'm not going to get into, and, but we're really going to focus on the pharmacy here. And so there's going to be kind of two main stages of treatment here. We're going to have the early kind of uncomplicated Parkinson's disease and then the later uh, more complicated patients who've already had more kind of substantial loss of those neurons. So early treatment of Parkinson's disease is going to focus on kind of two features here. One's going to be neuroprotection. When I say neuroprotection, what do you think that means? Protect the neurons. We want to keep those neurons around as long as possible. These are going to help to kind of slow down the progression of the disease, hopefully. Try to keep those neurons working for a little bit longer, okay? Um, you're going to find that in early Parkinson's, you're trying to hold off on levodopa kind of as long as you can, because again, once they're on levodopa, chances are they're not coming off of it. And at some point, levodopa is not going to really be all that effective anymore. And that's kind of like the in terminal stages there. But uh, two things we can do include monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, 
We'll talk about why that is in a second. And then also we can just replace the dopamine that their neurons would normally be sending out by just giving them a dopamine agonist instead. Um, as far as for symptomatic management, this is where our anticholinergics are going to come into play. We already said that you have too much acetylcholine activity leading to tremor uh, at rest. This is going to be able to treat that the symptom uh, in particular. And we'll talk about monomyoxidase B inhibitors. Again, we'll talk about COM-T inhibitors. It's a catecholamine O-methyltransferase uh, enzyme. And then we'll talk about some dopamine agonists. We'll have kind of two varieties there. Uh, this will also come up again when I talk about ergots uh, when I get to um, the migraine section. As well, anyone know where ergot comes from? It comes from a fungus. So we'll talk about that in a little bit later. And I also have some non-ergot derivatives. I just like to mention that because I'm a fun guy. You know, so. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. who's listening. Okay. And then we'll talk about the dopamine precursors. That's mainly our levodopa carbidopa combination there. Okay, so why is giving a monamine oxidase B inhibitor going to be neuroprotective for our patients? One of the things you'll see, if you go back, and I'm not going to have you memorize this or try to reproduce it at all, but basically when you have a metabolism of dopamine via monamine oxidase B, you end up getting this metabolite, and then you also get H2O2, which is otherwise known as? Hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide, is that a very stable molecule? Nope, I like to turn into free radicals. So again, if you guys remember my van from high school, the free radicals. Um, as these break down, these are very reactive uh, and they can cause a lot of oxidative stress on the neurons. And so these are thought to lead to more uh, degradation of the neurons and eventual destruction. And so if you can try to minimize that by blocking this metabolism of monoamine oxidase uh, B inhibitors, uh, then you can hopefully stave off that process for as long as you can until that drug wears off. And then you can switch them over to something like levodopa. Because again, is levodopa is a precursor molecule to dopamine. It's going to be stimulating this system here, right? Because you still have to metabolize it via monoamine oxidase B. So uh, two main monoamine oxidase uh, B inhibitors are going to include selegiline and then resagiline. Uh, selegiline is kind of interesting because it actually gets metabolized into L-methamphetamine and L-amphetamine. So if you were to actually do a urine drug screen on some of these older patients, you may think grandpa is having a little fun doing some, uh, doing some meth. Not true. He's actually maybe just on his Parkinson's meds, right? So that's one thing to always consider. Um, but as you might imagine, you can see some things like agitation, insomnia, hallucinations, and again, that orthostatic hypotension, which will be kind of uh, consistent throughout a lot of these dopaminergic acting uh, sort of drugs. Um, Resagiline uh, probably has a few uh, fewer adverse drug effects than, than selegiline does, um, so it may be preferential in, in, in some patients and, and doesn't get conferred, uh, converted into any sort of amphetamine derivative. So um, and you guys talked about serotonin syndrome at all. What is serotonin syndrome? Too much serotonin, that's true. What happens if you have too much serotonin? You feel great? You don't feel so great. No, you're, you're really hyperthermic and you're having um, a lot of muscular rigidity and can lead to seizures, all kinds of bad stuff. So we'll talk more about that when we get to the behavioral section uh, a little bit later on in, in, in this class. But um, basically any of these things that are blocking the activity of monoamine oxidase can lead to serotonin syndrome because not only are these metabolizing dopamine, but they also metabolize things like ser uh, serotonin, norepinephrine and whatnot. And so if I have too much serotonin activity um, going on via this and via other drugs, then you can see some uh, synergism there. So that is a theoretical risk. I don't know how many patients actually end up having this issue. You see this much more often with non-selective monoamine oxidase uh, inhibitors, and those are primarily the ones we saw used for depression many, many uh, years ago. Anywho, um, these can be used as monotherapy in mild kind of early uh, stages of Parkinson's disease, because again, they're going to be neuroprotective, treat some of those symptoms, and hopefully kind of uh, leave them to not need levodopa for quite so long. Uh, there are some contraindications, things you do not want to mix with, and this is primarily going to be other things that stimulate serotonin uh, release or, or inhibits metabolism. So there's some uh, opioids here, uh, which we'll talk about more in the ortho section, but things like tramadol, methadone, those all have some kind of pro-serotonergic effects. Um, other sympathomimetics like amphetamines, uh, even dextromethorphan uh, can be kind of pro-serotonergic. Uh, I guess remember what we use dextromethorphan for? Yeah, for cough, they are robotussin, essentially, right? Um, and then I mentioned the monoamine oxidase inhibitors and MAOIs uh, for depression, St. John's wort, uh, mirtazapine. Um, so a lot of antidepressants will interact with this, and even some anesthetics can pre uh, precipitate um, serotonin syndrome. So again, why this is a contraindication is just know that you mix these serotonergic drugs along with the monoamine oxidase inhibitor, there's that risk for serotonin syndrome. Um, also, why do I put this list of foods here? Why do I have a dietary restriction? Yeah, so these are foods that are high in tyramine. So again, tyramine is a precursor to things like serotonin and dopamine. So if I have a lot of food coming in, 
that can get converted over into those catecholamines and have a, a drug that's blocking the meta uh, metabolism, you can see how the levels could go up pretty precipitously. And so these are a list of drugs. This will come up again when we get to the behavioral section as well. We're talking about the older monoamine oxidase inhibitors. But um, you have a lot of things like, you know, aged meats, uh, aged cheeses, red wine, things like that, all tend to have a high amount uh, of tyramine in them, and it should be generally avoided while taking these medications. That's one thing to consider. Okay, so moving on from the MAOA, uh, MAOI B inhibitor, so next we're going to have uh, the anticholinergic. So these are primarily going to be just used to treat the resting tremor. Um, one of the big things you saw, though, and if you remember talking about like our first generation antihistamines like Benadryl, those had a lot of anticholinergic activity. Do you remember some of the side effects you saw from those drugs? Dry eyes, sedation, flushing. Remember the mnemonic? Line as a bat, dry as a bone, mad as a hatter. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about these, because again, these are generally older patients. Um, these can worsen those side effects. And we'll look at a flow chart a little bit later on kind of when you decide to use which drug. Um, and generally, these are going to be better for a little bit younger patients, because again, you don't want to worsen um, the, the mental status for these patients by giving anticholinergic. And again, just like we said, that you just can't give dopamine and an IV and expect it to work because it doesn't cross the, the blood brain barrier. You need drugs, you need or anticholinergics that will cross that blood brain barrier. So we're definitely going to see those kind of mental status changes there. Um, so this is going to include benstropine, trihexphenidyl, and then diphenhydramines. There are three different ones you could all potentially use in order to try that. Again, diphenhydramine being an H1 blocker, these two, benstropine and trihexphenidyl, tend to be a little bit more pure as just an anticholinergic drug. Um, going back to your behavioral stuff, do you remember seeing these used in conjunction with antipsychotics? So whenever you have a person who's getting like a, a dystonic reaction from being on something like Haldol, these are the drugs you can give to reverse that. So we'll talk about that more, but just know these are kind of an antidote to having uh, dystonic reactions from having too much dopamine blockade. So we'll talk about that later. Another drug we have is called amantadine or Symmetrel. This one, we don't really know why it works so well for, for Parkinson's, but it's good for kind of early... Um, early disease can help uh, from a symptomatic standpoint. It's thought to have some anticholinergic activity, so it's good for the tremor. Uh, it also is an NMDA antagonist. You remember what type of receptor that is? Glutamate. Yeah, it's a glutamate receptor. Absolutely right. We just talked about that with the um, seizure medications. But uh, again, these are all thought to help with some of the, the cognitive effects and also the, the kind of hypokinesia there. Um, you can also use it in, in conjunction with other drugs as well. So it can be used by itself, maybe used in combination. Um, but this can also help with some of the levodopa induced dyskinesias. We'll talk about those as kind of being a main side effect uh, a little bit later on. Um, also, some other uh, kind of off-label uses you may see this being used for. We would use this occasionally when I was rotating in the surgical ICU. If we had patients who had been had like a head trauma, uh, and they were, um, you know put under their sedated for a good long time and debated and they were coming out, sometimes they would not really just wake up and kind of become more conscious. We'd actually try to use a mantidine and try to wake them up somewhat. Uh, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. I don't know if they do that so much anymore, but that's another off-label use you may see there. Um, but again, otherwise, uh, okay drug, but not going to be good for more kind of uh, um, more progressive disease. Okay, next we're going to have our dopamine agonists. These are primarily going to work at D1, 2, and 3 uh, receptors. Um, you remember if you're looking at your antipsychotics, those are D2 blockers, right? So these are going to be kind of more non-selective and you're going to agonize any of these uh, uh, dopamine receptors. We're talking about the ergot derivatives and the non-ergot derivatives. We'll talk about that more in just a second. And these can also be used as first-line monotherapy for more mild disease. Again, these are going to be a little bit neuroprotective, similar to the MAOA uh, B inhibitors. Um, so that's another option you would have uh, potentially. They don't tend to be as effective as levodopa, so again, you won't get as much bang for your buck, um, but it could still be somewhat useful for kind of earlier onset disease. Um, make sure if you're combining these with levodopa, because levodopa turns into dopamine itself, you need to adjust your doses and usually kind of titrate down on one or the other first to make sure you don't get too much dopamine activity, because you'll see that at least to some of the dyskinesias that can occur there. Um, Okay. The other thing uh, to watch out for, kind of unique side effect from the ergot derivatives, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second, but that's going to be, you can have this pleuro and retroperitoneal fibrosis and uh, some valve uh, dysfunction that can happen there. It's kind of a unique thing you see with those in particular. So uh, here's some wheat, and this is actually the fungus that will grow on uh, this rye, I guess it's not rye, uh, I guess it was rye type of wheat, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, um, but you find this fungus that will actually grow in here. Um, and so does anyone know what illicit substance actually comes from this ergot fungus? LSD is actually a derivative thereof. So um, one of the things you saw, and you ever heard of uh, St. Anthony's fire? 
it's kind of an interesting story. So back in the medieval times, I think, uh, back when peasants and stuff, there were, were villagers and they were you know, making bread out of this, this rye. They didn't realize it was contaminated with this uh, ergot fungus. One of the things you'll see with having these dopamine agonists is that they can cause very significant vasoconstriction. This will become much more important when we get to talking about uh, migraines a little bit later. The basic cause very significant vasoconstriction, especially in the, in the periphery. So you can see the, their fingers become very uh, vasoconstricted. They would get uh, um, gangrenous in some cases. They have to be amputated. The, the feet would do the same thing. And it burned very, very, uh, or very powerful burning sensation, very, very painful for them. So they call it St. Anthony's Fire because the way they fix this is they would go take this pilgrimage to St. Anthony's Cathedral or whatever. Uh, they'd pray there, and all of a sudden they were fixed. What they didn't realize was actually happening is they were getting away from the contaminated rye. Um, once they were away from it, not consuming it anymore, the stuff left their system, and all of a sudden they were fixed. It's kind of interesting. Uh, but anyway, we were still able to use these uh, these ergots in order to get some dopamine agonists, and we'll see it they, also very good for migraines a little bit later as well. But bromocryptine is the primary one we we'll use in the case of Parkinson's as, as an ergot derivative. We have a few that are non-ergot derivatives, uh, permapexol, ropenorol, and rotigotine. Um, these are all going to, again, work very similar. Again, they can be used by themselves or in conjunction with some of the other medications we've already talked about uh, as a dopamine agonist. Uh, Reticotine is kind of nice because it's a transdermal product. So again, if you imagine some of these patients are going to have cognitive decline, um, remembering to take their medications can be very difficult. So this is good because you can slap it on for a few days, uh, not to think about it. You know, healthcare or the whoever is providing care for them um, just has to remember to, to change it out and make sure to rotate, rotate the site because otherwise if it gets put on the same place every single time, it can lead to ir irritation, skin breakdown, and whatnot. Not. Uh, this is also where apomorphine comes into, into play. This is actually a morphine derivative, but actually does not have any opioid activity itself. But what it is, is a very good dopamine agonist. I mentioned that you could sometimes use it uh, for diagnosis of Parkinson's to see if the patient, you know, their symptoms improve, or it could be uh, given sub-Q for um, a more consistent administration for really late stage Parkinson's, which I'll talk about later. Okay, and then the gold standard is going to be levodopa carbidopa. So why, why do I include the carbidopa? What does that do? It's a mum. It does what? Converting? Yeah, so it's an enzyme inhibitor. So kind of think about it similar to like a beta-lactamase inhibitor with the, with the penicillin, right? Uh, helps to block an enzyme so that way the drug can actually work a little bit better. So levodopa itself will con uh, convert it to dopamine, but there's this enzyme called L-amino acid decarboxylase. You don't only have that in the brain, but you also have it out in the periphery as well. And so if levodopa gets uh, gets affected by that enzyme in the periphery, it can't really cross the blood-brain barrier. can't really exert its actions there. So that's why we have carbidopa. It will inhibit this peripheral L-amino acid decarboxylase and will allow levodopa to cross the blood-brain barrier. Carbidopa will stay out in the periphery. Levodopa can go in and do its thing, get converted to dopamine, and, and act on those receptors. Okay. So some of the things you have to consider is that... Um, you know, these patients are going to be on this drug uh, potentially for a very long time, and so it's important to understand things about how uh, variable some of the kinetics can be. So things like the absorption of the drug can be affected by some of the transporters. So you might imagine dopamine uh, is a kind of a, a levodopa itself is kind of this amino acid precursor to dopamine. Um, it has to go through these amino acid transporters, and so if I were to take a levodopa at the same time as a high-protein meal, those transporters can get saturated, and you'd have less levodopa being absorbed. This is one of those things where if the drug's not coming on and working effectively, you may need to consider changing when you're actually giving it, maybe on an empty stomach or during, say, like a, a low-protein to no-protein uh, meal. That's one thing to consider. Um, and again, keep in mind the half-life is fairly short, but this is why we give it with carbidopa that will extend out the half-life. And in some cases, we'll actually even give it with a third drug. This will be one of those COMT inhibitors I'll talk about in just a second that can also extend out the half-life. So again, there's some debate about when you should actually initiate it. Uh, some people will start off with some of the neuroprotective drugs and then eventually move on to this. Some people may start with this, especially it depends on when you're kind of diagnosing the patient, kind of how far off or kind of how far gone they are uh, to begin with. But again, eventually all patients are going to require use of, of, of Cinemet, basically. And again, a lot of the side effects are very similar to all the other ones we've already talked about because they're all working similarly to increase dopamine activity. So hallucinations, insomnia, orthostatic hypotension, nausea, vomiting, all that's going to be very consistent here.
So just to give you an idea of kind of the different dosing strategies you have available to you. you know, I'm not going to ask you uh, specifically what the dose is, but um, keep in mind that usually uh, they will max out based on the carbidopa dose uh, due to side effects and whatnot you can see from, from that drug. Um, there's also contain, uh, controlled release formulations, which allow for kind of a more steady release throughout the day. Um, we're going to see that peaks uh, levels of this drug of levodopa can be problematic from an adverse effect standpoint, which I'll show you in just a little bit. Um, but having a controlled release preparation allows you to have a little bit more kind of steady levels uh, with a, a smaller peak and that can be beneficial for some. Um, and then you can even have things like an oral disintegrated tablet. So why, why would that be important for some of these patients? Dysphagia. Yeah, the dysphagia can be uh, pretty problematic. So there's some liquid preparations that are made uh, that can be socially compounded or you have a nice oral disintegrated tablet. You just let it dissolve in their mouth and kind of uh, uh, swallow it from there. As I mentioned, you know, it's difficult to say when you should start with which. Um, we definitely know that uh, Cinemet will reduce mortality in these patients. We know that they should be on it at some point. Um, but again, if you can hold off on that as long as you can in order to kind of preserve those neurons, it's going to be more beneficial for the patient in general. And then the last group of meds here is going to be these COM-T inhibitors. Again, that's that catecholamine O-methyltransferase, just another uh, way of attack to try to prevent dopamine breakdown. Um, Again, you need be, uh, you do not want to use these in combination with the MAOI inhibitor. Um, so you want to make sure you're using one or the other, but not both, because again, that can really uh, predispose to that uh, serotonin syndrome we're worried about. Um, Generally, you're going to find this most often used as uh, an adjunct when the patient's already on Cinemet. You'd add this on additionally, because it's going to help that levodopa to stick around for a little bit longer and more of it gets converted to dopamine. The two big ones we have here is called tol tolcopone, which actually has a lot of hepatotoxicity associated with it. So we don't use this too, too often, but entacopone is actually a little bit more often used, a little bit better tolerated, and oftentimes will come in a combination with Cinemet already. So that way you get, kind of get all three drugs in one, uh, and it helps with compliance a little bit. So they're not taking quite as many pills. So looking at this little flow sheet here is going to be useful to kind of give you an idea when you should kind of start which drugs. Um, note here that you're already starting with a diagnosis of Parkinson's and you kind of identify whether or not they're having any symptoms or not. Um, if they're having no significant impairment, then you can go ahead and consider starting off with some resagiline. You remember what type of drug that was? That was that monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. So that's one you can consider starting with, even if they're not really ex uh, exhibiting a ton of symptoms, a ton of impairment, because again, that may be neuroprotective. It may prevent them from going on sentiment a little bit longer. So that's one thing to consider starting with there. If they're having pretty significant tremor, if they're less than 65, you can consider starting with the anticholinergic. Greater than 65, you worry about that kind of um, uh, CNS impairment you can see along with those drugs. And so oftentimes, I'll actually just recommend them going uh, straight to sentiment in that case. But they're a little bit younger. I could try using anticholinergic first and then eventually progressing on, on to sentiment. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if they were, say, less than 65 and they're having a lot of rigidity, bradykinesia, this is where you can go with the dopamine agonist first and then eventually over to cinnamon. So again, it's kind of give you, uh, and again, depending on the patient, you may decide to go one way versus another, but it's kind of a general guideline to kind of help you out there. And obviously, uh, I always want to consider, you know, using good uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, whatever, to, in order to make sure they kind of maintain their function as long as they can. So generally what you're going to find is that early on, we're going to start that monotherapy, as I kind of mentioned. Uh, later on, you're going to kind of add more uh, adjunctive drugs together. So you may start with a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor, and you'll add on, say, a... Um, um, add on something like a dopamine agonist. Uh, and again, this is what we call it, that this uh, levodopa honeymoon, essentially. We're trying to hold them off uh, from getting on. Because once I get on levodopa, it's going to be super effective. But once you're on it, you're kind of stuck there um, uh, you know, until the drug is really not effective anymore. And eventually, that's really the only drug that's going to be working for them. And eventually, levodopa is just not going to work uh, that at all. So um, it depends on the patient, how long they you know, live with the disease to see how far along they get progressive on this. Um, but again, levodopa is eventually going to be the only drug that's really working at all for them if, if it's still working. So there's some uh, complications here when you get into later stage Parkinson's disease. There's a lot of motor fluctuations that can happen here. Uh, when I say wearing off, that basically means that you take the medication, it works for a while, but it wears off uh, too early compared to when your next dose is going to be. So that can be one problem there. Um, you have delayed on where it takes uh, too long for the drug to really kick in versus when it used to. And then there's some unpredictability in some cases where you may have on off that is not um, super predictable. We'll talk about some reasons for that and how we can combat that in a second. And then uh, in some cases, you may even see freezing where basically they have such bad depletion of the dopamine, uh, they have basically, they're, they're catatonic and they really have no motor function hardly at all. Um, and so again, that can be uh, pretty problematic in this much more progressive sort of patients.
Now, on the other hand, if you have too much dopamine activity, you get these dyskinesias where basically you're having these kind of inappropriate movements that can occur. Um, and certainly there's a lot of good videos on, on YouTube and things like that showing people who have had uh, dyskinesias. Um, a lot of this can be related to peak dose effect where the peak of the drug is getting too high and causing dyskinesias. And in some cases, I'll, I'll talk about these biphasic uh, attacks that can happen here. And obviously, if they're having a lot of dysarthria, dysphagia, um, that's going to be much more progressive, much more uh, debilitating. Uh, so we need to consider things like, you know, using levodopa oral solutions, because, again, they're going to have a di difficult time swallowing tablets. Um, consider things like surgery and even apomorphine sub -Q might be an option there. But looking at this picture is kind of uh, useful. So starting early on in, in Parkinson's disease, imagine here when you're below this threshold, um, you're having symptoms of, of hypokinesia, right? Once you get above a certain level, this is where you're going to start to see improvement in their symptoms. Above this point is the dyskinesia threshold. We start to see this kind of inappropriate uh, involuntary movements that are occurring due to too much dopamine activity. So the idea is you want to keep in the sweet spot right here, right? So make sure you're not getting too high and not getting too low. You're right in the Goldilocks zone there. Um, over time, they're going to notice as you get more modern and progressive disease, that level of dyskinesia is going to drop. And you're going to see that patients are going to spend less and less time in that sweet spot. And so they're going to have a minimal window there where they're really getting their symptom improvement without getting the dyskinesias occurring. And so we don't try to avoid this if we can. Uh, and we have some ways we can uh, combat that. So if the treatment is wearing off, I mean, they're kind of having these progressive loss of the neurons. Um, the drug's not sticking around and, and working for as long as it should. This is where you can do things like adding on entacapone. You can help the, the levodopa to work a little bit longer by blocking its metabolism. Um, we can do things that add on a dopamine agonist. Um, some cases you may even see the mate will use Cinemet more frequently. So it's something between like six to eight times a day. Again, I can barely take medication one time a day. Uh, imagine taking anything six to eight times would be very difficult. So this is where a lot of uh, you know home care uh, can be very useful for helping these patients out. I mentioned using that, that cinematic oral solution to kind of help with that. Um, Monomine oxidase B inhibitor might be useful here as well. And then in some cases, you may want to use like a cinematic CR. So again, these are all just different uh, strategies to try to help the drug last a little bit longer. may not work for every patient. may not last forever for, for these patients. You may find you need to switch strategies as you go along. Some cases, you may even have like duodenal levodopa infusions. Uh, obviously, that's going to be much more invasive, but it could be one way to uh, try to get around that and have a much more consistent level. Because, um, again, if you can just give uh, an infusion, you can keep a pretty consistent level throughout the day rather than have these peaks and valleys that occur with like a typical oral intermittent administration. Um, if you're having an off dystonia, especially like in the morning time when the patients are waking up and they're having very significant hypokinesia, this is where you can do things like adding on a bedtime dose of Cinemet CR to kind of uh, hold them out throughout the night. Um, again, consider adding a dopamine agonist or taking their Cinemet in the morning. Uh, and even botulinum toxin can be very useful here because what does um, Botox do? Yeah, it paralyzes the muscle. So we can do that for particular muscle areas of spasticity for them. Uh, it's going to help to reduce a lot of that rigidity and help them be a little bit more functional. So that could be very useful in, in, for some patients. Um, and then if they're having a, a kind of an unpredictable on-off uh, phase here, this is uh, where you can consider things like protein redistribution. So we may want to move, say, all your proteins off of one meal and allow them to take their medication without having a lot of amino acids to, to um, compete for those transporters. You know? Um, you know what you call tyramine when it's in a bad mood? Amino acid. Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, just make sure you're awake. So again, just think about it. If I had a patient case on a, on a test and it came up and said, hey, patient's having an early off um, uh, phenomenon, having this, uh, you, you know, their resumption of uh, hypokinesia prior to their next dose, what could you do to combat that? And so we might have some options on there, like adding on a COMT inhibitor or changing them over to a CR formulation, things like that. So you just kind of use your common sense and as far as what you know about how these different drugs work in order to come up with a solution for that. Okay. Now, as far as the, the dyskinesias here, this kind of peak dose effects here, obviously you can consider lowering your dose of Cinemet. That would be one thing. Uh, but then you kind of run the risk of having the opposite effect and not really having a lot of resolution of their hypokinetic symptoms. Um, you may also want to consider uh, discontinuing things like COMT inhibitor or the monomyositis B inhibitor. Um, Amantadine might be useful here, and also uh, for some patients, they may even um, get some benefit from using a drug like clozapine, which is actually an antipsychotic we'll talk about later on, or something like propranolol. I don't really know how that really works quite so well, but um, tends to be useful for, for some patients. And then... Um, in some cases, uh, a lot of times you're seeing these kind of biphasic peaks that are happening here, which you can use, use a controlled release formulation. Again, that just helps to kind of label, level out the uh, the effects a little bit better, try to um, get not quite so high peaks, and just have a nice um, kind of controlled plateau there. So, and you can imagine if you were to have, you know, a nice controlled release uh, preparation. Let's see if I can get that to work. I think I might have froze my stuff. 
Please pause. I'm having technical difficulties. Oh, here we go. All right, so anyway, if you had a controlled release preparation, you can kind of see I have more of a kind of a effect like that rather than having such a high peak and, and a low trough there. So that can be useful for some patients. Okay, so as far as monitoring goes, make sure you're looking at um, their administration times. Look at it where it's at in conjunction with when they're eating and, and see kind of what they're eating, see if there's any problems going on there. Um, a lot of these drug regimens can become more uh, complicated, especially as you're adding on multiple drugs. So it's important that they can understand that, or if they don't, make sure whoever's giving them the medications understands that. Um, okay, that's primarily it for Parkinson's. Any questions on that section? All right, let's do a 10 minute break. We'll come back and then continue on. The rest of this. Okay, any questions from the first half? Shh. Any questions at all? Okay, um, so no pun intended, but I forgot to, I for, keep forgetting to mention this. Um, who has me for their, for research methods? There should be roughly 31 to two hands. Fantastic. Um, feel free to come by whenever uh, to discuss your projects or if you want to email or whatever, carrier pigeon, whatever works for you. Um, <laughs> I tend to be uh, uh, pretty available in my office. Just come by and knock if, I, if you think I'm there or not. Um, I moved my professional day to Monday, so I will not be here Mondays anymore. But as you can see, I'm here now Fridays. Um, so that is one. Just know that if you come by Monday, I'm, I'm never going to be there. So anyway, uh, but yeah, feel free to come by whenever. We can talk about your project, uh, any ideas, maybe steer you in one direction or another. Uh, and, and it's pretty pretty easy. Pick five minutes. It should be not too bad. So um, okay. So going into Alzheimer's, this section is pretty short. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have a whole lot of good meds for this, which is sad. Alzheimer's is kind of sad. What is Alzheimer's? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that was not only rude, but also quite a joke I just made uh, previously. So, <laughs> anywho, I'll forget about this one. This, this, this just once. Um, anyway, so Alzheimer's, right? We're still having this neuronal degradation, right? But primarily affecting uh, a lot of our, our memory neurons, so to speak, right? So we're having a lot of uh, issues, especially in the hippocampal region, the cortical neurons. Uh, they're responsible for this. So initially, it could be you know as easy as like you know forgetting where you placed your keys, right? Most people do that every once in a while. Um, but it can get much much more progressive to the point where um, they're going to need you know 24-hour care, basically, uh, not able to, to perform any kind of activities of daily living. Uh, it can be pretty progressive and, and pretty debilitating for the patient. And and, and also bad for the their family and stuff, you know, especially when they don't even remember who you are anymore. Or they say really rude, inappropriate things to you because they they're, you know, uh, they just don't know any better, unfortunately. But um, again, kind of the hallmark thing you're going to see here, you get these neurofibrillary tangles, which is difficult to say, and also a lot of these plaques that happen here. And again, when you start to have this degradation down, you're going to initiate an inflammatory response. Uh, your white cells are going to be uh, going to try to attack that, and it's going to cause further damage, more degradations. This is why it ends up getting so, so progressive here. So um, the goals here, we'd like to treat any cognitive uh, difficulties we can. And is there any way to reverse this? Yeah. Nope. Uh, there's no way to do that. We can try to... Um, and again, even slowing down the progression is very difficult to do. So primarily what we're doing is just treating the symptoms, trying to help with their, their cognition and their memory as best we can. Uh, but again, this is not in any way going to be able to really slow down the disease, unfortunately. So um, two main pathways we're going to talk about. The first one is going to be the cholinergic pathway. The next one will be the glutamate pathway. Uh, but cholinergic neurotransmission is going to be a big thing we're going to be focusing on here. Um, Acetylcholine very important for, for uh, memory and things like that. So we, as you have progressive degradation of those neurons, you're releasing less acetylcholine essentially. So normally what you're going to find, uh, and this is going to go into the different um, uh, the drugs that we're using and their mechanism, but essentially, as you know, we covered previously, when you have acetyl-CoA plus choline, it's going to form together to make uh, acetylcholine. That gets released, and eventually it's getting broken down by acetylcholinesterase. So there's a few different uh, isoenzymes of that, but we're going to focus on primarily acetylcholinesterase and another one called butyrylcholinesterase. And so anyway, uh, it's going to uh, break that down into the choline, which can then be reuptaken into the presynaptic uh, neuron, and they can be recycled eventually, right? So uh, if we wanted to make more acetylcholine, what do you think we're going to do? Inhibit acetylcholinesterase, absolutely. So we're going to use acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. That's going to be the primarily uh, the big thing we're going to use to try to uh, increase the amount of acetylcholine we have available as best we can. So you can kind of see here in this picture how you have acetylcholine in normal ac acting brain, but as you lose these uh, these neurons here by increasing the levels of acetylcholine by preventing breakdown by using acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, you'll have more uh, available to interact with the, the receptors essentially. So pretty pretty basic uh, straightforward mechanism there.
So um, typically what you're going to find is that you want to have a longer half-life drug. You want drugs that stick around for a good period of time because, again, uh, compliance is going to be a huge thing for these patients, especially if they're, uh, you know, dependent on themselves for any amount of care because, again, they'll forget things very easily. Um, we also would like to have high enzyme specificity because the problem, if you were to have, uh, you know, acetylcholinesterase being affected throughout the entire body, what type of side effects would you expect? So you're seeing more acetylcholine activity, but you're seeing it throughout the entire body. It's affecting things like muscarinic receptors. What type of side effects might you expect? Increased. Yeah, increased the GI motility. That's a big one. So you see a lot of diarrhea associated with that. Salivation, lacrimation. You guys remember the mnemonic used for that? Dumbbells, yeah, these are dumbbells, right? So it's that defecation, urination, meiosis, right? Uh, Broncorrhea, bronchospasm. Um, remember the other one? I already forgot all the killer bees. My goodness. Huh? Bradycardia. Thank you so much. Uh, bradycardia, emesis, lacrimation, salivation, right? So kind of keep those in mind. Those are potential side effects you can see if you did not have really good selectivity for these CNS bound uh, acetylcholinesterase enzymes, right? So you'd like to have high specificity. They also have to get across the blood-brain barriers. That's another thing we need to see with these drugs. and need to be able to cross that over. Um, and then we also talk about the mode of inhibition. Um, ideally, if you had something that could be uh, more irreversible, it's going to stick around for longer. It's uh, more of a suicide uh, inhibitor, that, that enzyme, essentially. So um, you'll see some of these are going to be more or less reversible that will extend the duration of action of the drug. And like I mentioned, the dumbbells already, you see that cholinergic symptoms uh, associated with that. It usually can be as mild as, you know, just a little bit of diarrhea, incontinence, um, but it could be, you know, more, more progressive. You see bradycardia. Yeah, all that good stuff along with that. So ideally, we like something centrally acting, uh, and you're going to find that these cholinesterase inhibitors are going to be better to treat more mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease, uh, treat, uh, help with the, the memory and help with the cognition. It's not to say that if you have a very severe case of it, you're not going to continue giving these drugs. They just may not be super effective because, again, as those neurons get more and more degraded, there may just be less acetylcholine there to even affect in the first place. That's one thing uh, to think about. Um, but, again, this will not affect the course of the disease, will not slow it down whatsoever. This generally just treats the symptoms. So um, you find that the primary form, there's a few different enzymes of acetylcholinesterase. We're primarily concerned with this, uh, this G1 and G4. Again, don't get too concerned about worrying about the different uh, subtypes. Just know that there are different uh, ones that are available throughout the body. We like to focus on the brain ones, and if we have drugs that are more selective for that, that's, that's going to be better for the patients. Uh, you also have the, uh, this butyl cholinesterase. Um, we're going to find that uh, this one is not super specific for acetylcholine, but some of our drugs will have some cross-reactivity and affecting this may lead to some, some of the side effects we see. So we have four drugs that fit into this category. We don't use Tacron anymore. There's some issues with hepatotoxicity. So this drug is, is basically out. I just mentioned it here for uh, uh, comparative purposes. But you can see um, how uh, we'd like to have no hepatotoxicity. So that'd be great. So all of the newer ones we have, like Donepazil, Rivastigmine, and Galantamine, don't really do that. Um, and also, we'd like to have uh, uh, very few dosing administrations necessary. So if, uh, again, with Tacron, we had to give it all the time. It was not super useful for someone who had compliance issues like an Alzheimer's disease patient. And then we'd like to uh, mitigate some of these side effects, those cholinergic side effects I kind of mentioned here. And again, obviously longer half-life is important. This one has a star on it, because even though it looks like it has a very short half-life, this one is very um, binds to the, the enzyme very tightly and does not like to let go. So the reversibility is very slow for that one. So even though it looks short, it still sticks around for quite some time. So uh, Denepazil or Aricept, uh, again, this one is going to be uh, probably one of the more common ones. I think it's probably one of the first ones that really came out and got really kind of more of a kind of blockbuster sort of status. Um, but it's going to be relatively specific for acetylcholinesterase and has a good long half-life. So it will stick around for a while. It only has to be given once daily. And that's going to be uh, preferential from a compliance standpoint. Um, again, very mild cholinergic side effects. Again, can be dose dependent as well. So consider, you know, um, how big of a dose your patient is getting kind of monitor for those side effects. Um, it is metabolized by CYP2D6 and 384, but it actually does not inhibit it or induce those enzymes itself. So again, just be aware if other drugs are affecting that, that would be one thing to consider with those drug interactions. Uh, we have rivastigmine or Exelon. This one is going to have a relatively short half-life, as I mentioned, but it actually covalently binds to acetylcholinesterase, so it sticks around for a heck of a lot longer. Um, and so uh, the half-life dissociation of that is about nine hours. So again, it leads it to work much longer than what you'd actually think based on the half-life of the drug. Um, but still does about twice a day or so. It's not as convenient, but uh, still is better than, than you know, more than that. 
And then we have Razodyne or Galantamine. Um, this one has you know kind of a moderate half-life, still given twice a day, um, but it's going to be working pretty similar to Denepazil for the most part. Again, still metabolized by those enzymes, um, uh, 3A4, 2D6. So just be aware if you have other interacting drugs there. Okay, so the other side of that, you have those three acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. You also have the, this glutamate pathway. So we'll have one drug that fits in this category. Um, again, glutamate, we said is inhibitory or excitatory? Excitatory, right? So if I have too much glutamate activity that can lead to excitotoxicity of those neurons, can lead to further degradation. So if we can have something that blocks glutamate activity, then this actually will help and will help to, to mitigate some of that excitotoxicity, help the neurons stick around for longer, presumably. That's kind of our, our thought. Um, and so we can uh, do that by trying to block these glutamate receptors and limiting that, that transmission there. So we have memantine or nemenda. This is an NMDA glutamate receptor antagonist. So again, even though um, you know this blocks an NMDA very similar to something like ketamine, you don't see the same type of activities here. So there may be some specific subtypes of those NMDA receptors it's hitting, but it uh, basically works as an antagonist here, better for more moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, um, and can definitely help with the improving that cognitive function. It's pretty well tolerated for the most part, not a ton of side effects associated with it uh, for the most. But again, just looking at the mechanism here, um, by blocking glutamate, by just blocking this uh, calcium from entering in here, calcium cannot cause that oxidative stress and eventual apoptosis in that neuron, which is a good thing. Let's see, again, again single daily dosing, so pretty convenient from that standpoint and very minimal side effects. So again, this is gonna be better. Um, it's undetermined whether this is neuroprotective or not. Some thoughts, or you know, at least, you know, uh, presumably you'd think that based on the limited excitotoxicity, but I don't know if the studies have actually borne that out, unfortunately. So again, early on, start with an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, and then eventually you can move on to more uh, moderate to severe disease going with this um, uh, memantine. And that's it for Alzheimer's. As I mentioned, not a whole lot of drugs, not a whole lot for that, unfortunately. Any questions on that? All right, moving on, we have multiple sclerosis. Anyone, have we got, covered that yet? Okay, so what is multiple sclerosis besides, hard to say. Demyelination. Okay. So demyelination, what is that? Why does that matter? Slower propagation of? Yeah, well, the action potential is down, down the neurons, right? So uh, if I uh, remove that myelin, you're going to have, and again, why, why are we attacking the myelin? What is attacking the myelin? Yeah, our, our own immune system, right? So this is based on an autoimmune condition. Uh, this is going to go back to the other conditions that are similar to this and as far as management goes. Um, so we'll look at some of those uh, in just a little bit. But, right, we're going to have uh, this inflammatory disease of the CNS. You see these kind of plaques or sclerosed areas there uh, that are pretty indicative uh, of MS itself. But... And again, I'm not going to go through this whole pathway here, but just know that we have these different sites um, that can be targeted with things like monoclonal antibodies. We have um, different uh, ways that we can try to uh, limit the, the inflammatory response here. Another big thing to consider is uh, the inflammatory cells getting into the CNS, right? The CNS is typically a sequestered area based on the blood-brain barrier. So if you can hopefully prevent some white cells from crossing over, that can also limit that inflammatory response. So we'll see some drugs that specifically do that in just a little bit. So kind of keep that mechanism in mind uh, as well. And again, is this a reversible effect? No, so we're going to look at ways that we can deal with acute exacerbations, acute uh, inflammatory reactions, uh, and then we're also going to look at disease-modifying therapy, meaning that we can slow down the progression of disease, but we cannot reverse it. Once that myelin is gone, it is gone. What lays down the myelin? The Schwann cells. I was going to say Schwann. Sorry, anyway. Um, right, so we have the three main categories for um, uh, treating MS. Basically, we're gonna have these treatment of exacerbations. Again, the idea here, and again, these can be pretty debilitating for some patients. They may end up getting admitted and, and, and managed with this. Uh, we can uh, treat that, as we'll see, as an acute kind of inflammatory reaction. So we'll see how we treat that in just a minute. Um, next, we're gonna have disease-modifying therapy. This is gonna be for more chronic uh, uh, maintenance of care, try to mitigate uh, symptoms and try to mitigate those, uh, those relapses that occur for those patients. We can prevent exacerbation. That's gonna be done with these DMTs, essentially. And then we're also gonna look at a few symptomatic uh, meds that we can use to help improve quality of life for those patients as well, okay? Um, and our main goal here, improve quality of life, obviously, and then minimize a lot of long-term disability. Um, and again, so a lot of these patients, I mean, they can have a lot of chronic uh, pain conditions that come about from this, they have uh, chronic, you know, uh, urinary incontinence and all kinds of other problems that come about. So again, we're going to see that uh, really the big thing is to try to get those disease modifying therapies on, to slow progression, treat the exacerbations as you need to, and then we'll look at the symptomatic therapies as well.
So typically exacerbations, just like with any other autoimmune condition, uh, we've kind of alluded to already, uh, uh, we can use corticosteroids, right? So glucocorticoids are going to be really good for knocking down that acute inflammatory reaction. Usually something like IV methylprednisolone can be very good for this. And it may need something like three to, day, uh, three to 10 days of therapy in order to try to get that under control. Again, it's usually going to be like an inpatient sort of thing when they have really severe exacerbations. Um, now, can I use methylprednisolone to treat them forever? Why not? Steroids bad, right? Why, why steroids bad? So we can see issues like uh, glycemic control. What else? Hmm? Osteoporosis, absolutely. And again, who's going to get MS primarily? Females. Females more predominantly get MS. What else? Immune system. Huh? Yeah, the immune system. So you can see uh, immunosuppression. So you can end up seeing risk for infection. Anything else? You see mood alterations, right? They have a difficulty sleeping, weight gain. Adrenal, yeah, so uh, with acute withdrawal, for sure, yeah, so you see adrenal suppression that occurs chronically. So this is not a good idea for kind of chronic long-term. We'll talk about a few rheumatologic conditions we're going to use. Uh, you probably already talked about them. We're going to use more uh, kind of chronic uh, corticosteroids, but this is not one of those conditions typically. Um, but you're going to find that the earlier you can start treatment, the better to try to mitigate how long that attack is going to be. And you'll see improvements usually three or five days or so. Um, but again, we talked about a lot of the side effects. And actually, in some severe cases, the steroids might not be enough. may even need to do uh, plasma exchange. We actually pull out the plasma, get rid of a lot of those inflammatory cytokines, and then uh, put new plasma back into the patient. But uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that. So that's one thing. Um, next, we can have disease modifying therapy. And so um, basically, we're going to see that we decide who to treat based on kind of clinical uh, predictors of disease severity. So we can kind of predict who's going to do worse than others. We can get them on disease modifying therapy, hopefully. And then also looking at the safety and tolerability of some of the current meds. Um, we're going to see there's uh, drawbacks and, and uh, uh, pros and cons to every drug we're going to talk about here. Some of them can be pretty significant. The other thing is uh, cost is going to be a big issue. A lot of these drugs, super, super expensive. Um, but on the flip side, if you have them out of the hospital, uh, that may equate, you know, equal out. Or if you kind of avoid opioid addiction and things like that, that can um, kind of uh, equalize that out to, to some degree. But anyway, the big thing to note here, this is not going to be a rapid fix. This takes time. It may take, say, one to two years of therapy to really see full efficacy for this. So you need to let the patient know that this is not going to be a quick fix. This needs to be consistent. Make sure that they're taking it appropriately uh, and, and to stick with it as long as they can. Um, and again, we have a new second generation agents we'll talk about, and these are kind of revolutionizing uh, care for this, especially with some of the oral agents we now have. Uh, they're making this a lot more kind of realistic than uh, some of the older, um, really nasty side effect laden drugs we, we, we have available to us. And again, mentioned anywhere between seventy to $200,000 a year uh, for some of these therapies, so very, very expensive. So the first set of drugs we have are called the interferons. Have I mentioned interferons before? I mentioned briefly, probably in the chemo section, possibly. Um, we'll see this as well uh, when we talk about hepatitis. These are going to be immunomodulators. We don't know the full mechanism here, but uh, basically these are thought to you know, alter things like um, uh, you know, suppressor cell function, activating lymphocytes, T cell proliferation, also in affecting blood brain uh, barrier permeability. So if you can limit that permeability, less of those immune cells are crossing over and, and causing inflammation. So that can be uh, beneficial uh, from that standpoint. And just kind of give you an idea of the different formulations that are available. Again, these are proteins we're injecting. They'll have to be either IM or sub-Q, as you might uh, notice here. So they can either be self-administered or they may have to come into like an infusion center. But most of these you can uh, probably administer yourself. Um, but again, you can see here how, uh, how much these are costing uh, per year of therapy. So again, pretty, pretty expensive from, uh, from the standpoint. Now, we don't really like this quite so much because uh, they cause a lot of significant side effects. Um, one, you can see some hepatotoxicity associated with them. Um, cause, uh, you know, check a baseline, see what their LFTs are looking like, and then follow it over time. See if they're having any big problems with that. And then you can also see some, um, uh, you know, leukopenia, see some suppression of, of the white uh, cell counts. There's a lot of flu-like symptoms as well associated. It's kind of one of the more common side effects. Have a lot of myalgias and fever or headache kind of associated with that. Um, those can be managed with just typical OTC sort of fever management. So some Tylenol can kind of help out with that uh, to some degree. Um, injection site reactions, because again, these are going to be uh, parenterally administered drugs. And then actually with, especially the 1Bs, you can see a lot of mental status changes, especially depression. Some people get very aggressive or angry when they're on these medications. So it's really not pleasant to be around someone who's on interferon, uh, which is kind of unfortunate, but it's uh, one of the things they, they run into with these drugs in particular. Uh, next, we have glutiramir, uh, or uh, copaxone is the brand name there. This is actually a polypeptide, so as you might imagine, being a polypeptide also has to be injected. Um, and this one is actually trying to mimic uh, 
um, this antigenic property is this myelin basic protein. So if you see MBP, that's what that's referring to, this myelin basic protein. And if it can mimic this, uh, it can help to inhibit this T cell, or, you know, it's a T cell activator essentially. So it can try to uh, mitigate the effects of that protein. Uh, and that will help to actually uh, prevent MBP from binding to the T cells and prevent their activation in the first place. Kind of like a false binder. It doesn't really activate the cells themselves, which is nice. Um, Self-injectable product. And again, this one you're going to see uh, a lot of injection site reactions. And some people will get this kind of chest tightness, uh, flushing and dyspnea with this. This one, um, you know, it's good to monitor for them that the first dose they're going to get to see if they have any more severe reactions, but just know it can happen with really any dose. It usually lasts about 20 minutes or so and it's pretty uh, much uh, uh, self resolving but it's good to let them know because, again, people feel chest tightness and pain. They're going to think I'm having a heart attack or something, so make sure you educate them on this beforehand. Uh, next, we have natalizumab uh, or Tysabri. So what do you think about this drug? What do you know about it already, just based off the name? Yeah, it's monoclonal antibody, absolutely. So this is actually an antibody that is directed at this very late antigen one. So I don't know if there's a very early antigen or not, but maybe they found this one later than the others. I don't know. Um, oh, uh, fun fact. Do you guys know that there is a protein or enzyme system that is named after Sonic the Hedgehog? You know, look it up. I'm not joshing you on that one. That is actually Sonic the Hedgehog uh, based enzymes, which I thought was very funny, which made me want to discover my own proteins. I can name them something goofy, but anyway. Um, so basically what this is doing, uh, this is mimic or uh, basically an antibody targeted against this VLA uh, uh, protein. And it actually, uh, when VLA1 interacts with the CNS vascular cell adhesion molecule or VCAM1, that is what actually allows for lymphocytes to cross uh, the blood brain barrier. So if I can have an antibody that will target that VLA1 and prevent that from uh, uh, syncing up with that VCAM1, I will prevent lymphocytes from crossing over. And that helps to mitigate a lot of the inflammation against the, that myelin sheath uh, that is also important for those patients. Now, this one has a RIMS program. Do you guys remember what a RIMS program is? We talked about with like something like um, Accutane, remember? So these are drugs that have like a really significant side effect or uh, very potentially uh, dangerous uh, to a fetus or to the, the patient taking them. So you have to uh, register the program, use the provider and the patient has to register even the pharmacist occasionally does, um, meant to monitor for these kind of issues. And so for this one, um, they have a RIMS program for this progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy um, that was seen in some of the clinical trials. Again, not everyone's guaranteed to get this, but I do want to monitor for that one. And there's some other problems you see, some depression, fatigue associated with it, um, and some hepatotoxicity. So again, watch out for those. Make sure you're monitoring for mood changes and, and, and look at their liver enzymes. So this is kind of one of the big ones that kind of has, has changed a lot of things. Um, so fingolimod or galenia is actually one of the first oral disease modifying therapies for multiple sclerosis. This is kind of one of the big big changes. This one is um, working as a sphingosine one phosphate receptor agonist. And so interestingly enough, what this will do is actually sequester um, uh, circulating lymphocytes into lymphoid organs. So basically all the lymph nodes will take up these uh, lymphocytes and that prevents them if they're sequestered there, they can't get over to the CNS to have their, uh, to cause their inflammation. So um, as you might imagine, Imagine one of the side effects you would expect to see would be a lymphoma as those uh, start to kind of swell and as they accumulate those lymphocytes, but that is reversible. That will go away once you stop taking the medication. And you can see some first dose bradycardia, so you do want to watch for that in the, you know, in the clinic, see how they respond to it, and then you can go from there. Um, this will also lead to risk for infections because, again, you're uh, binding up those lymphocytes. They may not be out in the, you know, uh, circulating around in order to, to fight off infections. So that's one risk there. And actually, what's interesting here is that if you're going to give a live vaccine, you need to make sure you give it before you start this medication or uh, two months after discontinuation. Why do you think that is with a live vaccine? Yeah, so think about if you had like uh, uh, someone had a really significant immunosuppression and I gave a live vaccine to them, what could you see? You could, yeah, you could actually have activation of the disease because again, it's still even though it's attenuated uh, uh, vaccine, it, it's still live, right? So you can still potentially see disease, and so that's why these patients are functionally immunocompromised, uh, and so that's why you want to avoid giving these at the same time. And so it takes time for that that uh, uh, you know, the immune system to kind of get back to normal, and so that's why I say wait two months. So after discontinuation, and they can give another live vaccine. So one thing to, to watch out for there. Uh, next, we have teriflunamide. This is actually going to be a cousin to um, a drug we'll talk about when we talk about rheumatoid arthritis later on uh, called leflunamide. And this is actually an active metabolite thereof. So again, it's another oral medication that a patient can take, which is, again, very beneficial. They don't have to inject themselves on anything. And this one is actually going to uh, inhibit this enzyme that actually prevents proliferation of T and B cells, essentially. And so um, by inhibiting that proliferation, you're going to be reducing the number of inflammatory cells that are able to get to the CNS and prevent them from having any kind of inflammatory reaction.
Um, notable interactions, if you have a patient taking warfarin, you can see a 25% bump in their INR. It's going to be pretty bad because if I saw a bump in their INR, what could I then see? Bleeding, bruising, yes, yeah, so that would not be a, a good thing, so we definitely want to monitor for that. Um, other things you can see, a black box warning for hepatotoxicity and uh, teratogenicity. So what's actually really interesting about this uh, is that you can see levels of this drug detectable up to two years after you discontinue it. So the concern is, is say, if you want to get pregnant in two years, um, that's going to be a problem, right? Or anytime within the next two years, that can be uh, an issue for the patients. And so one of the ways they can actually work to eliminate the drug more quickly is to use what they call a uh, cholestyramine washout. Do you remember where you saw cholestyramine last? So yeah, it's a bile acid question. We saw that back in the hyperlipidemia section. So uh, presumably, teriflunomide gets uh, circulated via enterohepatic recirculation. And so as it gets spit out in the bile, you can have something like cholestyramine bind it up and prevent it from being reabsorbed, and then you just eliminate it in the feces. So that could be one way to get levels down more quickly if the patient decides, hey, I want to get pregnant um, you know, sometime before that two-year period. So that's one thing to, to consider for them. The other big thing is you want to test for TB prior to starting therapy. Why do you think that is? Yeah, so if they have latent TB, uh, you're weakening in their immune system, you can have activation disease. So that's another thing you want to test for beforehand. Uh, next, we have dimethyl fumarate or uh, tec uh, tecfidera. And so this one, we don't really know how it's working specifically, but it is another oral agent you might have available to treat uh, uh, MS. And again, fairly well tolerated, but you may see some uh, lymphocytopenia, increased LFT, so you would want to monitor for that. And some flushing associated with that can be somewhat common. And then we have alimtuzumab, which is going to be another monoclonal antibody. This one is actually going to be an antibody against CD52, which is going to be found on a lot of these uh, T cells, B cells, and lymphos uh, macrophages, I should say. Uh, it's going to be found there. So if you can bind that up, you prevent their activation. Uh, so they, can, again, can suppress that immune response uh, pretty significantly. Um, now, you're going to find that a lot of patients end up having a reaction to this. Uh, so you can see headache, rash, uh, you know, fever, nausea associated with that one. Uh, you th can you think of anything you might want to uh, use to mitigate that? So in steroids, in some case, you may consider giving. What else could I use? Benadryl. Yeah, Benadryl is a really good one. Anything else? You can also give some Tylenol beforehand, too. So again, consider kind of what these, uh, if you know a patient's going to have a, because this will be something they'll get you know, continuously, um, you know, uh, consider what you should pre-treat them with to uh, mitigate some of these reactions. So if you can give, you know, we, for drugs like this, we will very frequently give Benadryl, give a one-time dose, and then we will have PRN orders for like steroids available. And then the other thing is if they have a true like uh, anaphylactic reaction, what would we use? Yeah, then you have epinephrine. So again, you want to have those doses available and have, have PRN orders ready for them so that way they can uh, administer it uh, as needed, you know, in case there's an anaphylactic reaction. Um, and of course, this is going to cause suppression of the immune system, so you do want to worry about that. Um, certainly, uh, a herpes is going to be a risk, and so they actually recommend prophylactic acyclovir for some patients uh, in order to prevent uh, them contracting that. And then TB is going to be another risk, getting a test for it beforehand. Um, also, another thing, and again, this probably would not be the first drug you want to jump to, because about 30 to 40 percent of people actually develop subsequent autoimmune conditions uh, up and above with the MS that they already have, which is kind of unfortunate. But you can see thyroid issues; this tends to be the most common one. Uh, we see type 1 diabetes develop, uh, glomerular nephritis, hemolytic anemia, again, very serious uh, consequences you want to monitor for. This is probably going to be more uh, second or third line agent once uh, some of these other ones are not really working for the patient. So. Typically, uh, if they have a poor prognostic indicators, you know, uh, poor predictors, this is when you want to uh, uh, initiate some of the disease-modifying therapies. Usually things like natalizumab or fingolimod, teriflunomide, those are all going to be good kind of first-line agents as induction in order to kind of get their symptoms under control uh, and, and, again, uh, control the symptoms for kind of the, the long term, uh, essentially. Um, you're going to find that different patients are going to respond differently to these drugs. Some of them, uh, most of the time, we're going to have to change therapy due to adverse drug reactions. It's going to be the biggest thing. And then insurance is going to be a huge uh, determiner of uh, of if they're going to be able to cover these medications or not, right? In a lot of cases, um, paying for the drug is better than having them in the hospital frequently. Uh, so that, it just depends on what the insurance coverage actually is going to um, pay for. Also, you should worry about the route of administration. Obviously, oral is going to be a lot better tolerated by most patients and things have to inject themselves. Uh, for some of the symptomatic management of MS, you're going to have things like, uh, for the spasticity, we're going to use a lot of muscle relaxants. I'll probably talk about this more in the ortho section. We have drugs like baclofen and cyclobenzaprine. Um, uh, so those can be very useful to help with that spasticity. These actually work through the GABA B receptors, as I kind of mentioned um, uh, yesterday in reference to the different types of GABA receptors. Remember things like benzodiazepines and uh, barbiturates, they work on which GABA receptor? Uh, 
yeah, it's gamma A. So these are working on gamma B. So again, there's uh, some differentiation how they're how they're working specifically. Um, but things like gabapentin or pregabalin could also be useful for this. It's kind of acting as a muscle relaxer. Um, and then also you could consider using bo uh, Botox if you had like a particular muscle that was giving you issues. You can inject into those specifically to to lead to less spasticity. And then we'll talk about the urology uh, stuff later on, but typically for the bladder, um, you can use anticholinergics. Um, usually anticholinergics will do what to the detrusor muscle? Relax or squeeze it? Because if I squeeze the bladder, that would cause urination, right? But if I relax it, that would allow it to fill up better, right? So um, typically you're gonna see anticholinergics, which again is gonna anti-parasympathetic, is gonna allow for better storage within the bladder, will allow for that detrusor muscle to relax and hold on to more volume. Uh, so we can use drugs like that. So we'll talk about this more when we get to uh, talking about urinary incontinence later on, but oxybutynin, solifenis, those are all good uh, anticholinergics that allow for that, that muscle to uh, relax, okay? Also some patients may benefit from self-catheterization, although you like to hold off on that if you can, because imagine uh, if you're putting a catheter in or on these disease modifying therapies, what could be a risk? Infection can be a big one, right? So you want to be careful for that. Uh, for some of the sensory symptoms, they end up getting a lot of paresthesias, um, a lot of pain associated with that. We can use things like carbamazepine or phenytoin and also some of our tricyclic antidepressants. We'll talk about those more when we get to the behavioral section, but tricyclic antidepressants are also potentially very useful for neuropathic pains, uh, as you'll see. And then for fatigue, they do suffer from a lot of fatigue associated with MS. And so things like amantadine, as we saw, I kind of mentioned using that for patients who are in the ICU, try to wake them up. The same thing can be done here. Um, some antidepressants may work for them, things like amphetamines or stimulants. And then, uh, you guys ever heard of modafinil or modafinil? Um, I think I talk about that somewhere in this class. Pretty sure I do. But anyway, uh, you guys ever heard of ProVigil or NuVigil? These are drugs that were originally designed for patient, uh, for uh, people who work uh, night shift. Uh, for like shift work disorder, basically if you work the night shift all the time, your circadian rhythms get all screwed up and it's hard to stay awake at night and sleep during the daytime. Uh, and so these drugs are, are helpful to help kind of reset that. And that can help with some of the chronic fatigue these MS patients actually develop as well. So we'll talk more about that later when we get to talking about um, uh, medication for sleep. That one will definitely knock you out. That dog. Anyway, uh, any questions on MS? That was not a good joke, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm just going to keep um, let's talk about headaches, something you probably are experiencing right now, if one were to guess. Um, all right, so several varieties here. So the primary thing we're going to talk about is migraines, since those, uh, those have the most options as far from a pharmacologic standpoint. There's different varieties there. You have some people who develop auras. What's an aura? Yeah, so it comes on before the migraine. Usually some sort of sensory signal that the patient's getting. They kind of know that, uh, you know, a migraine's coming on, essentially, right? So it could be like a certain smell or they could, something with the lights, you know, they, they kind of know when a, a migraine's coming on. Not everyone has that, but it's something to consider. Also tension headaches and cluster headaches, which we'll talk about briefly uh, once we get uh, done talking about the migraines. So what is a migraine? Okay, so there's some vasodilation, that's important. What does that vasodilation do? Increase the pressure on the brain, more specifically what? So there's the trigeminal nerve is one of the big things there, right? So what you end up seeing is that usually there'll be some area, uh, it has kind of the spread of depression that happens uh, and it will cause vasodilation to occur. So you're gonna see blood vessels open up. Uh, and this is gonna put extra pressure on things like the trigeminal nerve. Additionally, you're going to find some release of pain-causing sort of uh, mediators. You're going to things like substance P, uh, some other ones like calicrine, they end up getting released, and that's all going to lead to a lot of the pain uh, that gets uh, that occurs there. The reason why I talk so much about the vasodilation that's happening here is primarily a lot of the drugs we're going to be dealing with are going to be vasoconstrictors, specifically at these cerebral blood vessels. By constricting down those vessels, it's going to relieve a lot of the pressure on the trigeminal nerve, and will also, as a secondary effect, will help with blunting or a lot of the release of those those mediators deal with that, some of the inflammation, it will help uh, eliminate the, the migraine itself. So some of the goals we have for long-term management of migraines, so if we can reduce the severity and disability, it's going to be great. Uh, uh, traditionally, what you're going to find is that, again, like other disease states, we're going to have things we can do for acute treatment of migraines. We're also going to have some preventative therapies as well. Uh, we'd like to be able to get rid of all migraines for people, but in a lot of cases, that is not going to be possible, unfortunately. But if we can at least predict them, 
knowing they're going to happen, we can hopefully try to treat around that. Um, we can try to reduce how frequently they're occurring by using preventative therapy. That's also going to be useful as well. So we're going to try to shoot for that and try to improve quality of life. So I don't know if any of you suffer from migraines or know someone that suffers from migraines, but how, dis uh, how uh, uh, debilitating can it be? Very. Very, right? So I mean, I know people that are down for 24 to 48 hours and they have a migraine, a really bad one that comes along where basically they just need to like hold themselves up in their room, turn off all the lights, turn off any sound and just wait it out, right? Because they get so severe uh, photophobia and phonophobia and all of that. Um, something my wife experiences all the time, especially whenever it's weird because whenever I show up at home, immediately there's a migraine happening. <laughs> I don't know if there's any correlation there, but just kidding. Um, also, we want to be uh, careful that we are not overusing a lot of these medications because one of the big complications of overusing some of these uh, headache treating medications, you can have a medication overuse headache that's associated with that. Basically, it's this kind of hyperalgesic uh, state that these patients get into where they're basically kind of more sensitive to the pain there, and they're using just more and more drugs. And so they get more, more, worse headaches, and they use more drugs, and that worsens the headache. So we're going to look at that a little bit later on, how we can avoid that. But that's one of the goals here as well. Um, and whatever we can do to try to shorten the durations of the, the migraine, shorten the, uh, or limit the, uh, you know, the, the effects thereof, if we can hopefully prevent recurrence. That's another thing you'll see with some of these drugs that they'll be good for treating the acute migraine, but then several hours later, it will come back uh, again. And so one of the recurrences is a big thing we're going to try to prevent as well. Okay. So there's obviously non-pharmacologic therapy. There's also a lot of OTC meds, which we'll talk about briefly, and then we'll talk about the prescription therapy that's available. So behavioral therapy can be very useful. So especially if, uh, you know, migraines are due to stress, like if you're t you know, sitting in class for eight hours a day and have all these tests that are happening three times a week and, uh, you know, practicals and things like that, you know, the, the stress management can be very important here to helping, uh, you know, some relaxation training, you know, um, nothing better than someone telling you relax better. Just okay. Um, but also, you know, things like a headache diary can be very useful because you can avoid certain triggers. Like, so if certain types of food or if it's certain types of smells or something that will, will trigger off a migraine, uh, hopefully the patient can help to avoid that. So that can be useful. And again, regular exercise, make sure you're sleeping enough. All those things can kind of be useful here. Obviously, there's a lot of common triggers uh, for uh, for migraines. So think about things like alcohol, even alcohol withdrawal can do this as well. Um, caffeine, if you imagine, what do you think caffeine does to blood vessels? Should be a vasoconstrictor, right? So again, uh, if you think about caffeine withdrawal, anyone ever try to go uh, cold turkey from caffeine? What'd you experience? It was terrible. Right, you got like an immediate headache and you're super grouchy and sleepy and it's terrible. Uh, but a lot of that happens because you're having cerebral vasodilation that occurs there, right? So that kind of makes sense. And a lot of headache, especially over-the-counter headache medication, contains caffeine in it, absolutely. So that, that kind of makes sense from that standpoint. Um, MSG, aspartame, tyramine, everyone can uh, react differently to some of these different food triggers. Uh, again, smells can be another thing. Uh, even high altitude, loud noises, um, farm teachers, all those things could be potential triggers that hopefully you can avoid, hopefully over the next year or so. Okay, so uh, again, we will find that the treatment can either be uh, acute uh, abortive therapy, which means we're treating the actual acute migraine, and we'll get preventative uh, a little bit later, how we can hopefully prevent them from occurring in the first place. Um, and we should really be treating based on presenting signs and symptoms, and also their, the frequency and the duration of headaches that they're actually having. I'll talk about more of the, about those details when we get into the separate meds here. Um, Basically, you want to administer medications at the onset of the headache if possible, or if they have an aura beforehand, that can be very useful to let you know that, hey, I should probably go ahead and take this medication, right? So if I know I'm going to have a migraine coming on, take the medication beforehand, and that can be useful in order to uh, uh, hopefully prevent the migraine from coming on in the first place. That's one thing you can do. Um, and then, again, we try to limit use no more than two uh, days per week if possible. Right? It's always going to be the goal of less than two days a week. Uh, any more than that is when we start to run into that medication overuse I mentioned. Okay. So for more mild to moderate migraines, this is where we can get away with using some of our over-the-counter sort of medications. We have things like NSAIDs and other simple analgesics. So what are some options for NSAIDs? Naproxen is a good one. Ibuprofen. What else can we use? Hmm? Aspirin can be one. Indomethacin. That's actually a prescription-based product, but that would be another NSAID. Absolutely. Um, Acetaminophen by itself is generally not going to be good enough to really uh, cut through some of these uh, more mild migraines. You can use it in combination, though. So if you had a combination product, uh, like Excedrin usually has aspirin, acetaminophen, and, and caffeine all in combination, that could be one thing you could try. Um, just depends on the patient. If you're coming into like an acute care setting or like to the ER setting, and again, this is not an uncommon reason for patients to show up uh, to the ER. Uh, we get them, you know, several times uh, per day uh, over at Nemours. Have these, you know, young teenage females who are coming in with with migraines. In general, what we start off with is a liter saline, 
IV, and then we go ahead, uh, you know, of course, based on their size, uh, whatever's appropriate, and we'll give them a dose uh, of Ketorolac or Toradol. You heard that brand name Toradol before? It's a very common uh, IV medication or IM IV uh, that you can give uh, for this. And these, this is a very strong sort of NSAID, uh, very good as a um, uh, analgesic. Also helps, it has some opioid sparing properties, which is good. Yes, sir. Um, only if they have any, you mean famotidine? Yeah, uh, only if you end up having issues, um, uh, if they have GI upset, right? Hopefully this is not something they're taking around the clock every single day, um, but if it is something, because that's more for like um, someone with arthritis who, you know, they're more prone to having you know, GI uh, issues along with that. Uh, if this is someone who is otherwise relatively healthy, only taking a few times a week, probably don't need uh, to increase, uh, you know, add on like an H2 blocker or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, Toradol is very good um, IV, IM sort of medication you can use for these patients. Again, the question uh, you want to always ask these patients, especially if they're coming in to get treatment, is what have they already taken that day, right? Because that's going to definitely influence what you're going to get. So if they took ibuprofen two hours before they came in, I'm probably not going to give them another dose of Toradol, right? Or uh, if they took ibuprofen, they say, oh, we took it this morning and now it's two o'clock in the afternoon, they're probably okay to go ahead and get it, right? So you just take, kind of take that into account on uh, what you're going to use and make sure you're asking the, the right questions there. Um, generally, you don't need to use opioids. Very rarely do you ever need to use opioids for these patients unless they're absolutely, truly allergic to everything else. If you have someone who's coming in for a migraine and say the only thing that works is, is, is Dilaudid, mm, you should probably raise an eyebrow to that. Um, generally, opioids are not the best thing for migraines in general, right? The other big thing associated with migraines is going to be a lot of nausea and vomiting. And we haven't covered the GI section uh, yet, but we'll get to there. But I'll talk about these briefly, um, uh, how these can be useful here. So we have drugs like the phenothiazines. We'll cover these more in the behavioral section a little bit later because these are also, you probably already covered them in, in behavioral, right? So these are drugs used for what? Schizophrenia, typically, right? So these are antipsychotic drugs that we're going to be using here. Uh, and uh, a lot of these antipsychotic drugs had uh, kind of a common ancestry in, in regards to some of these other medications we'll use for things like nausea, vomiting, et cetera, because uh, there, there are uh, multiple mechanisms of action. But one of the big ones we have is called promethazine or Phenergan. I'm sure most people have heard of Phenergan before. Very good anti-nausea medication. It's a very powerful anticholinergic. Uh, and so that is very useful for working centrally to help limit a lot of the nausea, vomiting associated with the migraine. Uh, the other thing, uh, being an anticholinergic working centrally, what's another big side effect you might see from that? A lot of sedation associated with this. So again, if the patient's having trouble sleeping because of their migraine, that can be good, right? Uh, I remember one time I took a dose of Phenergan and I was knocked out for like 12 hours. Best sleep I ever had in my entire life. Also dry as a bone, which is great because I was like super sick and snotty everywhere and dried me out. It was awesome, right? So again, make sure you're using it for the right type of patient. Um, the other good thing about uh, promethazine is there's IV forms available. There's also suppositories that are available. So the patient's actively vomiting. You don't want to give them something orally, obviously. So a uh, suppository can be useful there. Um, another drug like metoclopramide or Reglan uh, can be very useful here, or uh, prochlorperazine or compazine. Again, these are all working pretty similarly. They also have some dopamine uh, 2 receptor blocking ability, which can help with some uh, nausea as well. So again, these are all kind of common uh, mechanisms here. On the flip side of that, if you didn't want to cause a lot of sedation for your patient, you could use something like a serotonin receptor 3 antagonist. And this is where your drugs like Ondansetron or Zofran come in. Again, we'll talk more about these in the GI section, but this is just another option. Typically, these uh, serotonin antagonists are not going to be very sedating, which is nice. So if they needed to go back to school or something, uh, this is something that would be uh, better for, for that patient, right? Um, also, on Dantron, usually you can either give it IV or there is uh, like an oral disintegrating tablet that's available if they didn't really want to, or if they're not really able to swallow anything due to that nausea. But again, we're going to um, talk more about the GI section. The other big thing to know is that some of the abortive medications we're going to talk about here cause very significant nausea and vomiting. And so it's good if you can pre-treat with one of these beforehand to make sure they don't uh, throw up uh, not only due to the migraine, but due to the meds we're giving. Okay. So from moderate to severe migraines, this is where we're going to have uh, our ergot show up again. So these are, again, vasoconstrictors. And these are going to be specifically working at these serotonin 1, 1D, and 1B receptors. These are going to be agonists at the 1D and 1B receptors, and that's going to cause vasoconstriction of those cerebral blood vessels. We'll do that, and then also presynaptically, it's going to help to decrease a lot of release of some of these inflammatory mediators, some of these um, uh, pro um, uh, pain sort of, you know, substance P and, and different um, uh, chemicals like that. So very useful. We have two main ones here. So we have ergotamine tartrate or ergomar. This is available as an oral drug or as a suppository. So again, good if you're having vomiting. And then we have dihydroergotamine or DHE. 
as you'll see, it's sometimes referred to or migranol is a brand name. This one actually has a nasal spray or a parental option that's available. Again, if you're having nausea vomiting, nasal spray is very easy to, to administer for those patients. So um, these are good because they do have a long half-life. They actually have a decreased recurrence of migraines after the fact, which can be very, very beneficial for them. Uh, and they have this intranasal form, uh, as I mentioned, is good for patients with nausea and vomiting. As far as side effects go, you will see that because they're a vasoconstrictor, they don't only work up in the CNS, but they also tend to work out in the periphery as well. So if you had a patient with, like, say, uncontrolled hypertension, that's not going to be good for them because it's going to cause their blood pressure to raise. If you have someone who has a previous uh, you know, cardiovascular issue, uh, coronary vessel issue, this can exacerbate that. So you do need to be careful who you administer to and make sure you're looking at those contraindications. Other big thing is don't use this in pregnant patients. This is category X, known to cause fetal harm. Do not use this in pregnant patients. We'll talk about who, what you use in pregnant patients a little bit later on. Okay. Um, other thing, we have this uh, condition called ergotism that can happen here. This is due to that peripheral ischemia. It kind of goes back to that St. Anthony's fire thing that I mentioned, where you can have cold, numb, kind of painful extremities, uh, like a paresthesias. And then in very rare cases, can you have things like um, MI can be induced, bowel ischemia, gangrenous extremities. This is going to be more for people who are taking bigger doses who are kind of self-treating and using too often. Not super common if they're coming into the ER and they get like a single dose of the stuff, right? Um, other things to, to worry about is if uh, the patient is also, we're talking about the triptans in just a second here, but this is the other main class of drugs used for migraines. Um, you do not want to use an ergot and a triptan within a 24 hour period together. They can cause very synergistic vasoconstriction and that can cause big problems for the patient, right? So this is why it's really good to ask, what did you take before you came in to make sure you're not gonna be mixing these two up, okay? So up next we have the triptans. So these are gonna also be 5-HT1D and 1B receptor agonists. So the ergots, really old drugs have been around for a long time next the triptans came out uh the first one we had this first generation drug was sumatriptan or imitrex I'm sure most people have heard of imitrex before right uh this one's good has lots of different um options that are available i should put i in here i don't know why i put ns but it should be intranasal uh subcutaneous has oral options that are available to, to administer based on you know if there's nausea vomiting going on and then we have a lot of second generation agents we have like zolmatriptan rizotriptan narotriptan almatriptan frovatriptan and elotriptan again it's one of those things where like they see the you know, the, the this blockbuster drug come out and a lot of companies are like, oh, we want to make a Me Too drug, right? So they end up coming out with a, their own kind of version of it. Kind of like how there's like a million different uh, ACE inhibitors. Kind of same thing happened here. Uh, but there's some, some clinical differences we'll talk about briefly in just a little bit. Anyway, yes, ma'am. Are they just in No, they're not in nature. They're chemically unique molecules, but they all work kind of through the same mechanism. So it's like different penicillins, right? Um, work through the same mechanism, just different flavors of the same type of concept, essentially. Right. So these numbers here uh, that I have are basically the bioavailability. So one of the big things that you'll see with uh, sumatriptan, it does not have great bioavailability. So a lot of these newer ones, the second generation, aim to having higher bioavailability. So you get kind of more bang for your buck out of getting those doses there. Um, again, they're working on the 5-HT1D and 1B receptors. They're going to be vasoconstrictive, and they help to eliminate release of uh, some of those inflammatory mediators, some of those you know, pain-causing chemicals there. Um, and they tend to be pretty effective. So around 85% of patients tend to get relief uh, for that migraine. One of the problems, though, with sumatriptan especially is you get about 40% uh, get recurrence within the same day, which is kind of unfortunate because uh, you don't want to go and get treatment. And all of a sudden you have your migraine come back a few hours later. So a lot of the second generation drugs were designed to get around that. So either they have a longer half-life, um, uh, or generally that's how they combat it, by having a longer half-life to avoid that recurrence later on in the day. And typically the two big ones that have that are going to be frovatriptan and that emerge, as I mentioned on the, on the last slide there. So... Um, as far as side effects go, you're going to find this is pretty common in most patients, but especially with um, faster acting forms like, you know, sub Q or something, you're going to see that they'll get this chest symptoms, kind of get this tightness, this pressure. Again, if you have a patient with a cardiac history, you want to be wary of that and make sure it's not actually like an MI you're inducing there. But for most patients, they'll experience this. It'll be transient and it should go away um, uh, with, you know, within a few, few minutes or so. Um, but they can also see some dizziness, paresthesia associated with that. But just be aware, again, it's usually pretty well tolerated. Same, similar contraindications here to the ergots. This one is not going to be as teratogenic uh, as uh, we'll look at pregnancy categories in a little bit, but they tend not to be nearly as bad as the ergots as far as pregnancy goes. So again, that's another thing I forgot to mention on the ergots, um, especially when you have like young female patients who are coming into the ER for treatment with a uh, DHE, you need to check a pregnancy beforehand, right? Because again, if you ask a young female, like, are you sexually active? How likely are they to tell you the truth? Who knows, right? So it's hard to say. You know, we always say in the tox world, how can you tell a patient's uh, lying to you? 
the lips are moving. Yeah. So uh, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, just to be safe, especially from a medical legal standpoint, you can check a pregnancy just to make sure they're not pregnant. Um, so we can look at this uh, as far as contraindications go. If they have any issues of vasoconstrictive uh, issues or coronary vessel problems, anything like that, those would be people that would be relatively contraindicated from receiving these. And again, no co-administration with ergots within 24 hours. Um, so how you choose uh, which one you're going to use, usually sumatriptan is going to be the cheapest and the easily, most easily available uh, one to use. And so a lot of people will start with that one. And depending on how it works for them, they will switch over to a different one. But I mentioned there's a decent number of people who end up getting recurrence. Um, so that could be a problem uh, for some people. A lot of times what I do for patients who come in for uh, uh, migraines, and typically this is not their first visit for a migraine, a lot of times I'll ask them what they've had before, what works for them, what doesn't. Because, uh, again, there's no point in trying something that they know is not going to work for them. So if they come in and I'm like, okay, what have you tried before? They're like, well, sumatriptan is terrible. I don't like that. But DHE worked great for me. That might be an indication. I'll go ahead and use DHE instead. Um, and again, a lot of it goes into provider preference as well. A lot of the older school providers, they like DHE. That's what they've been using for you know, 20, 30 years. A lot of newer people just go with the trip dance a lot. Cases. So it kind of depends. However, um, looking at the onset of action, you'll find that obviously sub Q is going to be a little bit faster. Uh, give it about an hour for it to really kick in. Uh, and then for the intranasal PO forms, probably about two hours or so for it to really to kind of assess uh, kind of full efficacy for those. As I mentioned, the second generation ones are really designed to uh, try to prevent the recurrence, they try to increase bioavailability, and try to decrease those side effects, namely kind of those chest symptoms that I kind of mentioned. Um, Big thing to note is that the longer acting the drug is, typically the slower it will be to onset of efficacy, right? Because basically you're not getting that really high peak like you would get with something like sumatriptan. So it takes longer for it to kick in, but when it does, it's hopefully you're not going to have a recurrence because it sticks around for longer. Things that have a shorter half-life tend to work much more quickly. Again, that's why sumatriptan tends to kick in within an hour or so, and it's usually pretty, pretty wor working pretty well. Uh, some other things they do, they try to be more uh, potent for those receptors. They try to increase that lipophilicity and will increase that half-life for, for a lot of them. And again, FERVA and Emerge tend to be the, uh, the longest half-life ones. So for instance, uh, and they'll vary based on which dosage forms are available. So like Zolmatriptan off an ODT or a nasal spray. These are just kind of examples um, to show you kind of some of the differences between them. But again, clinically, they're uh, very much interchangeable, except for the, like the half-life is really kind of the biggest thing that sets them apart. And a lot of it will be, what does the patient's insurance really cover? Right? What can they afford uh, to pay for? I mentioned narrotriptan tends to have a longer half-life, really good bioavailability, um, but again, slow onsets, so around four hours or so. So the patient's got a rock and migraine already, may not be the best option for them. However, if they have an aura that, you know, that precedes a migraine by a few hours, they may be able to use this beforehand, and then that works just fine for them. So again, take each individual patient into account. Uh, Rise of triptan. Um, one of the big things to note with this one, you actually have a, a big drug interaction with propranolol, and this is important to mention because when we get to the preventative therapies, propranolol is one of the gold standards we have to prevent migraines. And so it's interesting is you see a 70% increase in the actual uh, AUC of the drug when you give it with, along with propranolol. Not really sure the mechanism for which uh, enzyme system that is, uh, but basically you can decrease that initial dose and that will help to, to get around that. So it's not contraindicated, but it's something you definitely want to adjust the dose for from that standpoint. Hmm? Uh, area under the curve. That's basically the time, uh, basically a, a way to equate how long the body is under the effect of the drug for, essentially. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, let's see. Almatriptan, uh, only thing to note here, actually gets metabolized by CYP3A4, so if you had an inhibitor on board, that would be important to remember. Also, some monoamine oxidase uh, um, uh, metabolism, so if you had another drug that blocked that, it would be uh, of concern as well, as we've kind of already alluded to. And that's basically it. So again, most of them have Pretty similar efficacy for the most part, but again, the half-life is going to dictate how quick the onset is and how likely you are to see that recurrence. So uh, looking at that, you know, uh, patients who don't respond to NSAIDs, that's usually kind of the first stop you should take. And again, uh, uh, you can take NSAIDs along with the uh, ergot, and you can take NSAIDs along with the triptan. Uh, those are going to be fine, and most patients will start off by using an NSAID. But if they're not getting full relief with just that alone, that's when you want to consider using one of these, uh, either ergots or one of, one of the triptans here. Um, but again, just note, about an hour or so for, for sub-Q administration to really work, two hours or so for intranasal or PO. I mentioned don't use it within 24 hours of ergot because, uh, or even other triptans for that matter, it really should not be mixing and matching because, again, you can see really uh, significant vasoconstriction there, so that's no good. And, again, try to avoid more than two days a week if possible. If they're getting more frequent than that, that's where we're going to talk about preventative therapy.
So um, just a good flow chart, kind of giving you an idea of uh, how to how to manage these patients. Again, looking at uh, obviously good patient education is important here, kind of assess their migraines. Um, you know, if you know it's going to be pretty recurrent, you know, they already have an issue with this, that's when you consider prophylactic therapy. I'll talk about that in just a few minutes here. Um, but looking at the yeah, mild to moderate symptoms, start easy, start something over the counter, start something cheap, the NSAIDs, you know, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, whatever you need to try with that, and then move on to something like a combination product. You know, if it's still not working, that's when you consider using trip or uh, you know DHE or something like that. Obviously, if they're already having severe symptoms. You know, acetaminophen is not going to cut it. You know, ibuprofen is not going to work. So go ahead and move over to triptan or uh, uh, ergot. Okay. So for those patients who are taking way too many analgesics, these are usually patients who are having headaches that are greater than or equal to 15 days out of the month. It's very, very frequent. Um, if they're using something like an ergot, a triptan, or opioid uh, greater than 10 days out of the month, um, these would be considered patients who are having really frequent overuse of, of these medications. And so what you'll find is that the idea is you want to kind of gently titrate these patients off of those medications uh, over the course of several weeks, because otherwise, if you do it too quickly, they can see rebound headaches. And that's going to be a very quick way for them to get back on the medications just like where they were before, right? Um, generally, after two months or so, patients will be kind of back to their baseline. So it's important to make sure that you educate them well, let them know this is not going to be a fun process. There's going to be some with rebound headaches, but you got to go slow and try and gently titrate them off of that. So, uh, for instance, if there are less than 7 to 12 analgesic caps per day, again, this is uh, just kind of a general guideline. Some people may do different recommendations, uh, but you say discontinue analgesic. Um, you could do it abruptly, or if they're really concerned about having rebound headaches, you could do uh, gradually over, say, four to six weeks or so. Um, we'll talk about prophylaxis medications in just a little bit. Um, and then, again, the withdrawal symptoms can be days to weeks. So it's going to stink for them, but it's going to be overall good for them in, in the long run. And then if they are taking much more than that or they're pregnant, then you definitely do not want to just uh, continue abruptly. You want to go ahead and slow that down and do it over, you know, the, the, the four to six weeks or so. So um, do you guys want to power through or do you guys want to break? Power through. power through. That's what I figured. I was hoping to get through this with a little bit extra time, so that'll be good. Anyway, um, you guys won't mind if I finish early, right? No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Coke? Yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm just... Coca-Cola is what I meant for the recording. Uh, yeah, I do the diet do. If any do is to be done, it will be diet. Anywho. I've been talking a lot today, so I'm getting a little, a little squirrely. Anywho. Um, so who's a candidate? For preventative therapy, these are typically going to be people who have really recurrent migraines, um, you know, uh, things that are interfering with their daily activities per, with some frequency, or if they have a contraindication to or they have a failure of or overuse of other acute medications, basically. So really, anyone who's having these kind of recurrent migraines or they're overusing uh, abortive therapies, they, they should utilize some kind of pro, uh, prophylaxis here. Um, also, uh, this can help with the, the cost of some of these acute therapies, because again, if they can uh, get on something really cheap to kind of help... Uh, prevent the migraines that can be useful, especially if they don't have to pay for an ER visit or going to the acute care center or wherever it happens to be. And also, you know, patient preference if they would like to con you know, consider one of these medications that can be uh, useful for them. First line, though, is going to be our beta blockers. Right, 80% of people will get some efficacy out of this. And really the goal, uh, gold standard we used for a long time was propranolol. And that makes sense because if you think about the lipophilicity of propranolol, we mentioned it has really bad effects on nightmares in elderly patients. Because it is so lipophilic, it gets to the brain, which is where you want to work. So it makes sense why propranolol would be a good option for this. However, other beta blockers do show efficacy. So you could use things like atenolol, metoprolol, tim you know, timolol, any of these would work. If the patient had uh, asthma or, say, severe reactive airway disease, uh, which ones would be good options for them? A through M, right? So we mentioned like, you know, atenolol would be a good one, metoprolol would be good. So either of those would be good options for like an asthmatic patient. So again, even though we're not covering beta blockers like we did in the hypertension section, that stuff could still come back to bite you. So review it because there may be a question on the test. You can't say I haven't written it yet, but it could be there. Or might not be there. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, the big idea here is that if you think about it, it doesn't make sense because what should beta blockers do to uh, uh, blood vessels? Because we use for hypertension, right? So... Should dilate, so should, wouldn't that cause a headache? 
It can. It can, absolutely. So one of the things you can actually see is a side effect of using a beta blocker is that is headache. A lot of it is related to that vasodilation. The idea here is by starting a very low dose and uh, titrating up to kind of effect, you kind of set the, the baseline uh, for those blood vessels a little bit differently. So that way they don't really have the same, and you do have a trigger that comes along that should hit a migraine. You wouldn't really see that same kind of vasodilation you would have normally. So you kind of reach a new set point for them. Also, there's th some thought that it helps to in, uh, inhibit serotonin release from platelets. Probably a minor clinical effect, but the main thing is it blocks the vasodilation from happening as severely as it would otherwise. So that can be very useful for those patients. Other things we can use can be some anticonvulsants. I already mentioned that you'll see things like uh, topiramate and, and valproic acid to get used for lots of off-label indications. This is one of them. Um, and so these are thought to perhaps maybe stop the kind of that spread of de uh, kind of global depression that occurs when you have a migraine. And by preventing that, you can prevent those that dilation and that trigeminal nerve activation and all of that. Um, so valproic acid, another name you may see for it is divalproic. So you ever see that? That's basically what we're referring to is, is um, as a valproic acid there. So that's a very useful one that can be good for some patients. Other one is going to be Topamax. Again, that one had so many different mechanisms like blocking glutamate and infecting calcium channels, et cetera. Um, but this can be very useful as well. This is starting to become more of a first line kind of agent for migraines. Um, so especially good, you know, consider your patient's comorbidities. You know, if they have a seizure disorder, one of these are probably going to be a good option for them versus if they have hypertension, maybe a blade of blockers would be better for them in that case. So kind of think about those conditions. Um, obviously adverse effects kind of go the same, just like we talked about them before. Uh, as far as, uh, you can also use some antidepressants. We talked about tricyclics, we mentioned being used for neuropathic pain. You can also use them potentially for migraine prophylaxis. We'll talk about those in the behavioral section in a few lectures, but you have things like amitriptyline, nortriptyline. Amitriptyline is probably the most common one. Um, Elevil is another name for that drug. It's the, the brain name you may see for that one. And then um, SSRI is used um, not frequently, but again, if the patient had depression, this might be a good option for them. It may help with their migraines, may not, it just depends. Um, basically, this is working by affecting nor norepinephrine and, and serotonin reuptake sites. We'll talk much more about these in a later section, so uh, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And then also calcium channel blockers can be used occasionally. Usually verapamil gets the most use. There's been a little bit of use in nifedipine. And remember, um, uh, verapamil is what type of calcium channel blocker? The non dihydropyridine and the nifedipine would be which type? Yeah, that one is a dihydropyridine. So again, um, you know, the thoughts here, you're blocking that vasodilation that can occur. Now, initially, if you go too big of a dose too quickly, you certainly can cause migraines to happen due to vasodilation, but you can start low, gently titrate up. And then for some patients, they'll benefit from some botulinum toxin. This is usually to deal with some of the muscles in the neck to try to loosen those up a little bit. So that way they're not pulling quite so hard, which can happen with some patients that can precipitate their migraines. As I mentioned, start low and go slow. Um, and then you should consider things successful if you get about a 50% reduction in their migraines, either in recurrence or severity. Again, for some patients, you're never going to completely get rid of their migraines, but this can be very useful if you at least you know, cut it down by half potentially. Um, full benefit should be around in about six months or so to really kind of assess see how the drug's going. Um, and again, if one's not working, try to switch over to something else. So if beta blocker doesn't work, try Depakote, you know, that Depakote doesn't work, try Topamax, that doesn't work, try Verapamil, and you can kind of go on a stepwise approach there. But always consider coexisting conditions. Those are really good test questions. As I mentioned, you know, you have a patient with asthma and seizure disorder, and they need, you know, migraine prevention, what's a good drug, and like Topamax would be a really good one or something, you know, those are the kind of questions that I could ask. So you can imagine uh, another, um, you know, based on the kind of patient condition you can see here, um, basically what we just talked about, imagine they have like depression or insomnia, you know, you know tricyclic depression is a good option for them. Um, you know, if they have uh, hypertension or angina, beta blockers can be really good, or wrap milk could be an alternative there. So again, it kind of makes sense based on what you know about the pathophysiology, based on the uh, pharmacology of the drugs. Okay. So migraines uh, tend to happen a little bit more frequently in women, and some of these tend to be uh, more clinically associated with things like uh, their menstrual cycle, uh, which you guys have covered uh, pretty in depth from Professor Lack, correct? So, you know, kind of where estrogen is kind of dipping down and, and progesterone and all that. We'll cover that again when we get to OB-GYN. Um, talking about oral contraception and whatnot, but there's a few different um, uh, considerations we'll, we'll take uh, for female patients with migraines here because estrogen does play such a big role in, in, um, in migraines for them. So about 14% of uh, female migraine patients have these associated with their menstrual cycle. And so what you'll see is that um, these attacks are pretty predictable, right? Because you know when the estrogen decreases, um, these typically is when you're going to see a lot of these migraines start to uh, come up. So if you can predict when they're going to happen, you can start to take medication beforehand, hopefully to prevent them from happening in the first place. So for some of them, they'll recommend either taking NSAIDs, 
possibly estrogen-based product or triptan, say two or three days prior to the onset of menses, and then it will continue for about five to seven days or so. And then you stop and then wait till the next month. And then that hopefully that would help to mitigate uh, any migraines they might have had otherwise. So that'd be one thing you can do. So again, the more predictable it is, either with an aura or if it's based on a certain, um, a certain menstrual cycle, that can be very useful for prevention. Uh, as far as oral contraceptive use, you will find that for some patients, they may improve when they go on oral contraceptives, migraines. They may get worse or most likely nothing will happen at all. Um, but you need to just be aware of that, that those changes could occur, and you may need to change the type of oral contraceptive you're going to use. As I mentioned, we'll talk much more about this, I think, in the next lecture we get to. Um, but uh, doing things like changing the estrogen dose that they're getting or maybe switching to a, a progestin-only compound might be good for them. Um, or in some cases, you may want to use something that will actually decrease the number of estrogen withdrawals that occur. So typically, when uh, you're taking like an oral contraceptive, how are the, the packs normally organized? So you have like three weeks of active drugs, right? And then you have seven days of placebo, and then you start, uh, start a new pack. There are some that will actually be designed uh, to have fewer estrogen withdrawals than that. So you would actually have something like a seasonique or a season now that are designed to only have uh, four menstruations a year. So you'd actually take estrogen uh, throughout a three month period and then you'd have that one week uh, of placebo. That may help to mitigate some of those migraines for certain patients. So again, just think about these different strategies. Now it might be better for, for one patient versus another. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Again, it's not necessarily harmful to take estrogens consistently, um, but again, and some products are designed for that uh, for that purpose. And then uh, there's some thought that vitamin B6 may be uh, helpful with this. But again, you should be taking good multivitamin anyway, and it hopefully uh, contains that. Uh, as far as migraines and pregnancy go, uh, we'll talk more about pregnancy and meds uh, in the next session coming up, but typically the drug of choice is Tylenol. Tylenol is a very safe drug to use in pregnant patients and should be used um, as kind of your first line. Not a lot of good alternatives. So things like triptans are category C, and we said with category C, does that mean it's safe or not safe for a pregnant woman? I don't know. We don't know. We don't have enough evidence out there, right? It's not, we can't do those, those studies, unfortunately. So that's not super useful. Um, NSAIDs tend to be problematic in the third trimester. Anyone remember why? Inhibits uh, prostaglandins. You're correct. Uh, decreased prostaglandin synthesis. Not with surfactant necessarily. It's just something else. It's the, not the framework of value, but the, the ductus arteriosus. You can actually close that prematurely, which is no good for them. That's why it's a category D. So we don't use those in third trimester. Um, and then ergotamines, as we mentioned, are category X. So those are no good. In some rare cases, you may consider using opioid, but again, you usually want to hold off on those as best you can because they're not great for, for migraines, um, not great for headaches in general. But in, in some rare cases, you may need to use that. This is kind of the lesser of the evils uh, that are present here. Um, so if it's not working, that may be one option. But again, most, uh, or at least a lot of women I'm uh, familiar with do not have, um, they're worried about drug exposure to the fetus anyway. And so a lot of them will be hesitant to take drugs for this anyway. So even getting them to take Tylenol could be a problem, right? They may just say like, I just don't want to take it at all. I'll just deal with the headache. Opioids are in a category anything? They will have a category, but they are, um, it depends on the opioid you're dealing with, what it is. In general? A lot of them are going to be C, um, but it de depends on kind of what stage you're at in pregnancy as well. Like, you know, if it's closer to the, the birth, it may have some negative effects on the fetus. And again, just generally avoid them if you can. Right. Anywho, and then um, as far as preventative, we can try to use non-pharmacologic therapies, but a lot of things like beta blockers you don't want to use necessarily. Uh, a lot of the anti-convulsants um, are no good, like I mentioned about proic acid, is really bad for neural tube defects. So again, typically preventative medications are not going to be good for them. I feel bad for the pregnant ladies because I'm kind of like, you're tough luck, I guess. It's, I don't have anything good for you. You're pregnant, sorry. Yeah, it's a bummer. It really sucks to be pregnant, I should say that. Not that I've ever been pregnant, but... I can imagine. I've seen it twice now, up close and personal, not fun. <laughs> anyway, um, tension headaches. So I'll kind of kind of talk about these kind of in, in broad, kind of a broad category. So these are kind of just general headaches, you know, that most people kind of deal with. Again, OTC analgesics are generally good for most patients. So either NSAIDs, acetaminophen, et cetera, and all those are gonna be pretty good. Um, has anyone ever heard of Fioracet or Fioranol? Yeah, so that's a very common one I see uh, in in I probably see a little bit over, or a lot of overuse of this medication actually. So when you have a patient that shows up complaining of chronic headaches, this is a very easy drug to prescribe for them because uh, in a lot of cases it's a non-controlled substance and instead of having to prescribe them something like an opioid. And so I see a lot of patients, especially overdose patients who end up being on this. This is one of their uh, usually drugs they overdose on in their cocktail, so to speak. But basically this is a drug that combines either acetaminophen or aspirin. A good way to tell uh, which brand name it is, is if it's Fioracet, that C-E-T, think acetaminophen. 
That's the way I remember that. And then aspirin's fiorinol, and it'll be mixed with caffeine and butalbital. Anyone know what type of drug butalbital is? It's actually a barbiturate. It's actually uh, very uh, structurally similar to phenobarb. So if anything, it's probably just more sedating than it really has any good effects on, on treating a migraine. But that's that's a combination out there. Uh, again, if you look at the studies, the efficacy is probably equal to placebo. Um, so really not a whole lot of efficacy for, or use, evidence for use, I should say. Um, but it also commonly causes a lot of rebound headaches. So very bad drug. I don't really like it that much, but I see a lot of people using it regardless. But again, try to limit it to twice weekly use or less. And then as far as uh, prevention for um, tension headaches, you can see uh, sometimes amitriptyline will be used uh, as, a, as a tricyclic antidepressant. Occasionally SSRIs, but those tend to be not super effective here. And then again, if they are a smoker, uh, recommend cessation there. That actually helps prevent headaches uh, for them. And then finally, cluster headaches. Uh, cluster headaches are pretty nasty as far as um, severity of the, the actual pain and, and it goes along with the, the nausea vomiting. Um, typically, you're going to find that it will have similar abortive therapy as we'd use for migraines. So using something like ergotamines or DHE, triptans can be useful here. Typically, these are severe enough you want to use more parenteral therapy if possible, and they're also going to have a lot of nausea and vomiting. And in some cases, oxygen may actually be useful to them. I can just you know, put them on a non-rebreather or something that will help to kind of um, um, deal with some of the, the severity of the cluster headache as well. Uh, for prophylaxis, verapamil is a good option for them. It's probably effective in about 70% of those patients with cluster headaches, which is nice. And then uh, it, there's some evidence for use of lithium, which we'll talk about that when we talk about which disease state? Bipolar. Yeah, bipolar disorder. So we'll find lithium is going to be uh, useful for them. A lot more side effects. and There's more monitoring you have to do with that one. So it's not um, not without its limitations from that standpoint. Um, some people have pro uh, prophylactic ergotamine, although I've not seen it used too, too frequently. And some people have tried corticosteroids before. But again, not good for long-term use due to a lot of the side effects, which you've already kind of mentioned there. So that is the end of neurology. Is there any questions? I know it's a lot. So seizures, MS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and headaches. So the neurology, at least I'm going to teach us the main meds. Any questions at all? Okay. Uh, if not, I have a happy Friday, and I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Thank you.